This story has been in my family for years, but I never thought to share it here before. And before you ask, no, this story didn't happen to me. But yes, it is very much true. A little backstory. I have a huge family. My eldest auntie, we'll call her Jane, is the age of most people my age's grandparents. She's now almost 85. Our story begins in the 1950s, when Jane and four of her college girlfriends were on a road trip. They were on their way home, traveling through rural Wisconsin, still a couple of hours from their destination, when all of a sudden, they started having trouble with their car. They tried to keep going, but eventually had to pull over. Jane said they were all quickly getting worried. This was decades before cell phones. The sun was setting, and the nearest proper town wasn't for several miles, too far to walk. They weren't familiar with the area and didn't want to split up. When miraculously, a car pulled up next to theirs. The man who was driving asked them what was going on. They explained their situation the best they could, and he helped them to fix the car. They offered him some money for helping, but he refused. Jane said they all thought the man was a little bit strange, but they were still just grateful that someone had found them and helped them out. The man left, and the girls made it home without any more trouble. Sometime later, maybe a year or so has gone by, my aunt has gone about her life as usual, when one evening, a local man is arrested as he was suspected of the murder of a local business owner. The man is named Ed Gein, and the extent of his crimes beyond that single murder soon come to light. My auntie says when she saw him on the news, all of her friends started calling each other. They had all recognized him as the man who helped fix their car that night not so long ago. They were all shocked that their odd feeling about him wasn't just nerves, but rooted in the fact that they did come face to face with evil that evening. While everyone in that vehicle that night wondered why he didn't try anything with them, my auntie thinks it was simply because there happened to be five of them. He wouldn't have been able to take all of them, as he was outnumbered. Yin would go on trial in 1957 for two murders that he confessed to. However, he is suspected to have committed seven more murders that are still considered unsolved to this day. And unfortunately, will likely stay that way as Gein never confessed to them and passed away at the age of 77 back in 1984. There you have it. The story of how Ed Gein fixed my auntie's car. By all accounts, pretty solid mechanic. Much less stellar human being. This video is sponsored by our friends over at Aura. Like so many of us have done, I recently googled myself just to see what would come up, and what I found in the results were more horrifying than some of the stories that you find on our channel. It was way too easy to come across addresses, phone numbers, employers, emails, and tons of other information that I don't just want floating around for others to have. What I was shocked to learn is that data brokers around the internet sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may be looking to target you. And that's where Aura comes in. Aura is an absolutely amazing service that I happen to use to monitor not only my own digital imprint found around the internet, but to monitor and safeguard my identity from the millions of bad actors out there who are looking to prey on whoever they can get their hands on. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests on my behalf. Cleaning up what information can be found about me protects me from hackers who could use this information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, and a whole bunch of other sensitive information. Aura also does much more to protect both me and my family from online threats that I can't see. Features like antivirus software, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and much more without having to download several different apps. It's easy to set up, and best of all, I get everything at one budget-friendly price. 
while many of us have one or two of these tools already? Not having Aura is like locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open, which, as our content has shown over and over again, is not the move to make. Aura is always on, doing the hard work of keeping me safe so that I can focus on other tasks, like bringing you quality, bingeable content with peace of mind. Aura has already identified and erased dozens of threats directed towards my digital life, and I'm proud to work with them. When I mentioned that I'd like to extend that protection to my subscribers, they told me to say less. Check them out at aura.com slash malevolent mischief, or simply by clicking the link in the video description. Take advantage of the free two-week trial they're currently offering to subscribers of the channel. That's more than enough time to see where your name pops up on Google, what passwords show up on the dark web, beginning the process to mitigate those threats, and doing all that's possible to keep your personal identity safe and secure. Again, that's aura.com slash malevolent mischief for your free two-week trial to keep your identity yours. Now, let's get back to the stories. After finding many stories here, it reminded me that I have one that I thought I had forgotten. I'm a South American woman, but have been living in the States for about 11 years now. I first moved to Colorado when I was 21, to the small mountain town of Silverthorne. I was recruited by an exchange student program for college students in South America to come to the USA, both work and travel during summer break in the South. Up to that point, I had never even seen snow in my life, so I was extremely excited to be living in a cold, snowy place for once. I was going to be working at a very popular hotel in the town of Frisco, not too far from the hostel that I was living in. The hostel itself had its own creepy stories, but I won't talk about them in details at the moment. That can be for later, perhaps. So far, I didn't know exactly what kind of job I would be doing in the hotel. All I knew was that I was supposed to show up there on a certain date and time to talk to the owner. The owner was this Ukrainian-American guy that was probably in his mid-40s back then. I show up, introduce myself with all the basic English skills I had at the time, and tell him that I'm excited to start working there. He gives me a weird, long stare, almost as if he was analyzing me. He was a tall man with very pronounced eyebrows. Not one to judge, but... The look that he gave me then kind of creeped me out for a second. He then showed me to the restaurant and said I would be working there as a hostess in addition to delivering room service orders. I didn't really think that my English was good enough to be in close contact with the public back then. I thought I would be working back of the house or housekeeping, but he insisted. For those who are familiar with the area, this part of Colorado is not too far from Vail. So, it's needless to say that they get very, very busy during the ski season, and I was dealing with customers from all over the world. That's when I also started helping out as a server during breakfast time, and of course, I'd get a lot of orders wrong because of my lack of English, which made the owner very mad. I remember one time that my coworker and friend was taking a little bit longer to wipe down one of the tables when we had guests waiting to be seated. That's when the owner grabbed the towel from her hand, yelled at both of us to get out of his way, and to stop being so damn useless, before proceeding to throw the towel back in her face. Let me just make one small note here, to say that this girl was also an immigrant like me, although she had fantastic English, and had been living in the country for years. The owner would take every opportunity to try and find ways to show us just how slow, dumb, or inferior we were compared to him. Then, at night, after the pace had slowed down, he would then act all apologetic and buy us drinks at the bar, making forward comments about my appearance and even attempting to caress my legs. I was starting to feel uncomfortable around him and would always try not to be in the same room as he was. During work hours, I would be focused on customers or talking to my coworkers, and I would never make eye contact with him if he were present. On New Year's Eve that year, there was a big incident in the hostel I lived at. I was out that night with a few co-workers of mine, but learned later that one of the residents had gotten way too high 
on God knows what drug and started chasing down one of my friends inside the hostel. All the while, pointing a gun at him, yelling racial slurs and making death threats. The man got arrested, but it's easy to say that most of us students living there no longer felt safe. While talking about the incident to one of my coworkers the next day, the big boss overheard the conversation and immediately came to check on me to make sure that I was okay. I thought he was being very nice and thanked him for checking. He said I shouldn't be staying at that hostel anymore given the circumstances and invited me to stay in one of the hotel rooms free of charge for the next few weeks while I looked for a new place. That seemed very generous of him, especially given the fact that the hotel would be completely booked since it was the peak of ski season. I accepted his offer and moved in the next day. I was so overwhelmed with happiness for finally having some privacy. I was sharing a room with five other girls in the hostel and for getting some extra sleep before working my breakfast shift since I was now literally living at work. That was until one night later that week where I felt extremely exhausted after being slammed in the restaurant all day and delivering orders to several rooms. I was ready to get cozy in my hotel room and go to sleep, seeing that I was off the next day. It must have been around 2 in the morning when I woke up completely groggy and noticed that the door to my room was open. I could see the lights flooding in from the hallway. That's when I noticed the silhouette of a tall person standing inside my room and watching me sleep. I couldn't see a face, but I could definitely tell that it was a man. As I began to realize what was going on, I hear a metal clanking noise, as if someone was undoing the clasp on their belt. I immediately screamed. That person, whoever it was, quickly got out of my room. The next day, I brought this up to management and my coworkers and said that there was definitely someone in my room the night before. They said that I was probably dreaming or that someone from housekeeping must have gotten into the wrong room. Wrong room? At two in the morning. Housekeeping? The owner didn't comment on the case and stopped talking to me or even acknowledging my presence after that, which was to my relief. I eventually moved on, got a new job, a new apartment to live in. About a year and a half after my little incident, while checking the local Summit Daily News, who do I see on the front page? Him, the owner of that hotel. He had been arrested the night before after getting two female hotel guests way too drunk at the bar and then, quote, letting himself into their rooms once they had crashed for the night. They woke up, and there he was, standing there in the room, just staring at them, seemingly planning what his next move was. They screamed bloody murder and called the police immediately. Now, was it him in my room that night? I'm 99% sure it was, but kind of relieved that I didn't get to find that out. What creeps me out the most about the situation is that what about those nights I completely crashed after having one too many drinks? You know how the altitude can affect your alcohol tolerance? Well, I can testify that it really did it for me. I'm from the sea level and not a big drinker, but a few times I woke up with zero memories from the night before. So the even more unsettling question is, was this the first time someone got into my room? And how many more guests at this hotel had this happened to without them even realizing it? I've been a long time lurker on this subreddit, but I'd never thought I'd be here sharing my own story about an experience that I had. It was a Friday night and I had gone to bed early as I had work on Saturday morning. After reading in bed for a bit, I drifted off to sleep at around 10.30 p.m., only to wake up about an hour later to loud screams and people yelling profanities. I thought my girlfriend was watching a movie with the volume way up, so that's when I went out to the living room to ask her to turn it down a little. Instead, I found the TV was off and my girlfriend was staring at the front door with her eyes wide. Our apartment is on the ground floor of the building, and so our front door opens directly out into the lobby of the building. The voices in question were coming straight from the lobby. I couldn't make out specifics, 
In my defense, I was half asleep, and the language of the country that I live in is not my first language. But I could tell there was a lot of swearing involved. That much I knew. My first thought was that it was some kind of domestic dispute. But after listening for a moment, I realized it was a group of men that sounded extremely aggressive. I looked at the WhatsApp group chat for my apartment building, and to my horror, I saw a message from one of my neighbors that said that there were armed men in the building and that we should not leave our flats. The country that I live in is experiencing a marked uptick in crime, and I had heard stories of armed groups of men robbing entire apartment blocks. But up until this moment, those stories seemed fairly exaggerated to me. However, that was my first thought, that these men would kick down our door and rob us, perhaps doing something worse in the unfolding of events. I thought about barricading our door, but I didn't get that far. One of my dogs started to growl at the commotion outside. I quickly shushed him, and thankfully he obeyed. That's when I heard a commotion in the apartment directly above us, and went out to my patio to see what was happening. I heard what sounded like a large piece of furniture being knocked over, and women and children screaming in terror. At this point, I had no idea what was going on, but I knew that by now, they would have robbed us already, if that was what they had planned to do. My girlfriend and I decided to hide in a small shed at the end of our patio, monitoring the group chat on our phones. Our larger dog silently stood watch outside the door of the shed, his eyes locked on the sliding door at the end of the patio. I would later find my smaller dog cowering between the washing machine and the dryer. After ten extremely tense minutes, I heard the screeching of tires, signaling what I hoped was the perpetrators fleeing the scene. Eventually, someone in the group chat said the police had arrived, and breathing a huge sigh of relief, I came out of hiding and finally opened the front door. Alarmingly, on the floor of the lobby, there were zip ties that had been cut, and the security guard was talking to one of the tenants. The man was bleeding from a large gash on his face and appeared to be extremely shaken. Over the next few hours, the entire story would unfold. The man that I saw with the gash on his face was the tenant in the upstairs apartment right above ours, the one that I had heard the commotion coming from. He was the owner of an import-export business and, for whatever reason, had a sizable sum of money, in cash, hidden within his apartment. Someone had obviously found out about it and planned out the robbery that woke me from my sleep that evening. A group of eight men had followed him into the apartment building's garage and ambushed him as he got out of his car, and judging from the gash on his face, they roughed him up quite a bit. Some of the group of eight had gone to the lobby, surprised the security guard, and zip-tied him. The remainder of the group had gone up to the apartment, robbed it, and then fled the scene. I find it pretty chilling to think that armed men were only feet from my front door, that if they had incorrect information, or even if they just wanted to, our apartment would have been the first one in the line of targets. I've never been worried on a palpable level that my home or I could be the target for something like this, but we've since figured out a way to reinforce our front door in a way that'll hopefully ward off people with bad intentions, if it were to ever happen. I'm thankful that my neighbor was okay that night and that everyone survived that encounter. Money can be replaced, Life cannot. I also hope my neighbor learned to not keep large amounts of cash in his home. Best to not make yourself a target if you don't have to. This story happened about four years ago, around the time that COVID was just starting. So it was a while back, but I still feel that this is a worthy post. It was early 2020, and I had just gotten a new job in a small town near my area. While looking for a place to live, my sister offered to rent her house to me. She had bought the house two years prior, but she and her husband didn't really take to it, and their commute to work was long, so they moved out and the house was left uninhabited. Luckily for me, it was actually pretty close to my workplace, and my sister pretty much rented it to me for free. 
I just paid the water and electricity and looked after the house. I was living there for a solid two or three months and had already gotten used to it. One night after coming back from work and parking my car in the driveway, I walked towards my door and noticed something odd. There was a cigarette butt on the curb to my house. I leaned down and picked it up, thinking that it might have been mine since I am an avid smoker. But after looking at the brand name, I realized that it wasn't mine and threw it away. I didn't think much of it beyond that, just shrugged it off as some asshole throwing it on my curb. I went on with my night and nothing unusual happened. Two nights later, I was once again walking to my house when I spotted a few more cigarette butts, this time bunched up near my porch. Needless to say, I was pissed off and thought that someone sat on my porch while smoking, but since I didn't know who it was, there was nothing that I could do about it. I noticed they were put out pretty recently, so whoever it was probably walked off just before I started approaching. That night, I was watching a movie on my laptop and it was pretty late had to be past 1 a.m., so I was surprised when I heard a car passing by. It's a suburban neighborhood, and it was COVID, so people rarely ventured out at night, although I didn't think much of it when I heard it either. About a half an hour later, I was even more surprised when I heard a few people chattering nearby. I thought I heard two distinctly different voices. I listened intently, but I couldn't hear what they were talking about as their voice seemed almost muffled and quiet. By this point, I was getting a bit unnerved, so I stopped the movie and quietly crept off my sofa, walked to the front door to make sure that it was locked. As I was approaching the door, I froze mid-step as I heard two sets of footsteps approaching my porch and reducing the volume of their voices to no louder than a whisper. I realized right away that whoever this was was wanting to break in. I leaned against my front door and waited, expecting a loud bang against the door or the doorknob to be shaken, but it was oddly quiet. I decided to walk over to my window to see if they'd walked away or changed their mind. My windows have bars from the inside out that you have to unlock so that you could move the curtains or look out the window comfortably. I slowly unlocked the bar mechanism and lifted it up. I moved the curtains and was taken aback instantly. Leaning right up against my window was a man. He was as startled as I was because he basically stuttered over his own steps as he jumped back. He tightened his hoodie to cover his face so all I could really see was his big blue eyes looking right back at me. His friend realized what was going on and immediately started to kick the door in. He kicked it a solid five or six times but the door wouldn't budge. All the while, I was stuck staring at them, frozen in fear and trying to comprehend the situation. I eventually snapped out of it and slammed the bars over my window, locking them and running upstairs to the storage room where I pushed a table up to the door and called the cops. As I listened and expected the two to come inside my house any minute, I heard a loud crash and the bars from the windows being shaken aggressively. Once they realized they couldn't get in, one of them let out a long, angry scream that probably woke up half the neighborhood. But by the time the cops came, those two were long gone. The police couldn't find out who it was, but they were more active in the neighborhood in the following weeks. Regardless, I wasn't keen on staying there, so shortly after this incident, I moved out. My sister ended up selling the house a few months later, and as far as I know, nothing similar has happened ever since. I honestly don't know what they wanted or why they were so determined to get in, but whoever it was, let's not meet. Nobody takes me seriously when I tell this story, so I finally decided to post it. The backstory is long, but I swear it's important. A few years ago, I was 17, just graduated from high school and got my first job at a Christian camp near Yosemite in California over the summer. Mainly, the people I worked with were great, really sweet Christian college kids, the good kinds. There was this one guy, though, I'll call him Carl, 
who I frankly just did not like. Carl was tall, handsome, and charming. He had curly golden brown hair and a smile that could stop your heart. His eyes, though, were dead. He never got those little crinkles in the corners of his eyes when he smiled. It was like the top half of his face was just that, dead. There were things I didn't like about Carl right off the bat. His eyes, for one, that dead smile of his. He also never asked for anything. He'd just try to twist your arm. He'd very softly, very slowly try to manipulate the situation until you almost felt like you owed him. Each time, it felt like a part of my brain shut down. Like, it slammed a door shut, and there was a very clear feeling of, no, this isn't right. Not sure if this analogy will land, but he's the type of guy that you save him some food, but do not walk out into the woods to give it to him. Something was that type of wrong. I got along with most of the little cliques at camp. No one really disliked each other, as far as I knew. We just kind of broke off into groups based off what we liked to do in our free time, or who we worked with the most. Carl, though, seemed to make friends one-on-one -on -one within a clique. By the time he left the group, it had been decimated. They were fighting, not speaking, and didn't trust each other. I know this isn't a lot of evidence, but I'm trying to paint a picture of a man who just seemed wrong. One day, everyone in camp decided to go to Fresno. We were tired of camp food and wanted a real dinner, maybe see a movie or go bowling. I was off work last that evening. Now, at camp, we had a sign-out sheet. Being so close to Yosemite, we often went hiking. So if we left, we had to put our names down, along with where we were going, when we left, and when we should be expected back. This way, if something were to happen, they would know when to start looking for us. So, I put all my info on the sheet and headed down towards the parking lot. My friends had all divided up into their cars. I didn't drive at the time. And I jokingly asked if they had forgotten about me. They said Carl had said I could ride with him. I looked around, but I didn't see Carl, although I had seen his name on the sign-out sheet. All the hair on my body stood on end. I was terrified to get in the car with this guy alone. He felt off, wrong, and just like somebody that I didn't want to be alone with. I don't know how else to say it. My friends were telling me I had nothing to be worried about. Things would be fine. I eventually saw Carl walking towards the parking lot, that same dead smile planted on his face, and everything in me screamed not to get in the car with him. I said that I was tired and wanted to stay in tonight. That's when Carl laid the charm on thick, telling me what a good night it would be, that I owed him because of God knows what, flashing that dead smirk. But I refused. That's when he got angry, told me that I didn't need to be such a bitch about it. I thought we were friends, the whole lot. But I didn't back down. I still refused. Finally, everyone figured out that I wouldn't be persuaded. I hugged one of my girlfriends goodbye, whispering in her ear not to ride back with Carl under any circumstances. Once they all left, I walked back to the area with the sign-out sheet to cross my name off, since obviously I wasn't going anywhere. I saw the sheet, saw where my name was, and my heart dropped. My name had already been erased from the sheet. My name is Ben, and I live in Australia. In the southeast of Australia lies the state of Victoria, and in that state lies the high country, an extremely vast and remote expanse of alpine mountains and valleys that's largely only accessible by vehicles with four-wheel drive and can take days to get in and out of. This place is popular for explorers, deer hunters, and hikers. I own a four-wheel drive truck, and this was the destination chosen to go camping for a few days with my girlfriend, Jess. Some time away from the world beyond the reach of mobile phones. The four-wheel drive was loaded up, lists double-checked, vehicle maintenance done, fuel loaded onto the roof racks. 
the police station closest to our destination, we notified of our trip. It's common for people to notify them as a safety measure, especially when not traveling in a convoy. Again, very remote area. And off we went. We were headed to a place called the Wanangata Valley, a remote valley deep in the high country, a huge amphitheater type valley with alpine mountains rising high in every direction and a river running along the valley floor. Towards the end of the first full day of driving, we made our way down the last track for the day, skirting the ridge and arriving at the valley floor just as the sun dipped below the mountains. We found a secluded spot to pitch our tent, nestled in amongst the eucalyptus trees by the riverbank. It was midweek and off-season, so we were the only ones in the valley that we knew of. After setting up camp and having a meal by the fire as the sun went down, we snuggled together in our sleeping bags, and in short order, we decided to hit the hay. At some point in the night, I woke up to a loud noise. I wasn't quite sure what I had heard, so from inside of our tent, I listened. Nothing. I must be going mad. But no sooner had I thought that, I heard another noise. It sounded like something falling off of our camp table and hitting the ground. I put it down to possums or wombats slinking about, common in the area, and nothing to worry about. Man, we should have done a better job at packing up after dinner, I thought, and eventually fell back asleep. Sunrise came, and we slowly woke up. Needing to pee, I opened the tent and jumped out. But as I was looking around, something came over me. A chill. The campsite wasn't the way we'd left it. Instead of seeing two chairs together by the fire where we were sitting, one of them was by the table. And on the table was a loaf of bread that I'd sworn I packed away the night before. I walked over to the table to inspect. A half-eaten piece of bread was sitting there with very obvious chomp marks in it. I flung the tent open and asked Jess, were you up before me? Did you have some bread? But she just shook her head no. Jess got up and together we went through all of our stuff. Nothing was missing. As we went to check the truck, I noticed the footprints. There was a bunch of them around the front of the car where the hood was. Most of the camp was covered in grass. This happened to be one of the only few spots that was just dirt. Had someone tried to open it? Very distinct footprints. Not mine, or Jess's. Perhaps they'd already been there? These camping spots are used intermittently, and obviously we weren't looking at the ground when we arrived the night before. I don't think either one of us wanted to actually admit what we were both thinking. That someone had been creeping about our campsite in the night far from civilization. We discussed if a possum could have made the bite marks, argued about if one of us had left the bread out, and eventually discussed moving on and camping somewhere else. After much deliberation, we decided to stay. I had a rifle in the truck, which I guess gave me an overinflated sense of safety, which in hindsight was a pretty poor sense to have. As the day rolled on, the sun shining, and with nothing eventful happening, I decided to walk across the valley floor, about 800 meters, to an old ruin of an isolated homestead built by settlers who ran cattle in the valley some 100 years ago. It happens to be steeped in mystery. There's an old unsolved multiple murder case from 1917 that always captivates people. I read the plaque, took some photos, and started wandering back towards camp. As I neared the halfway mark back to camp, I noticed Jess walking across the field towards me. Must have gotten bored, I thought. As she approached, it was clear that she was in a panic. Immediately, she began to tell me how she went down to the riverbank to wash the pots and pans. And as she looked up, she saw someone over on the other side of the river, watching her from deep in the bush. I had no reason whatsoever not to believe her. I asked what he looked like, and got told, an old man, 70s or thereabouts, scraggly looking, and in old tattered clothes. Apparently, the second she looked up, he turned and walked away, disappearing into the impenetrable bush. 
I couldn't quite comprehend it. How is anyone out here without a truck or a dirt bike? How would anyone get to that side of the bank without first crossing over from our side? There's days worth of damn near impossible to walk through bush on the other side just to get to where my girlfriend saw him at. We decided to hop in the truck and drive along the length of the valley, checking out the dozen or so riverside camping spots as we went. I wanted to spot a camp, have my partner ID the guy, and make sure he wasn't creeping, with our theory being that he may have just been a hunter, off in the bush after a deer. After making our way up and down the valley and not seeing anything, we drove back to the camp at a loss, unable to explain anything. As the sun started to set, with both my girlfriend and I quite shaken, I grabbed the rifle and sat it next to us as we cooked dinner and chatted, having a few drinks to settle the nerves. Had we been spooked? Was it just that there's a lot of mystery surrounding the valley and the homestead murders? We talked a bit and settled into a good mood, warming in front of the fire. At some point, Jess needed to go to the restroom. I was asked to come with her to the spot behind a tree where we placed the portable toilet, no more than about 50 meters from camp. Considering everything that had gone on, it was a no-brainer. Jess did her business, and we turned around and came around the side of the tree. And that's when we saw him. Standing at our camp, about a meter from the rifle I had sitting against the table, was a man. Old, check. Scraggly looking, check. Tattered old clothes, check. Jess squeezed my arm so hard, I thought it was going to come off. Everything about her body language screamed, this is the same man. As we got closer, I could make out more odd things about him. He had part of a deer antler in his hand that looked like he'd been whittling away at it. And what looked like antler pieces carved to plug large holes in his ears, like stretchers, but made of bone. Same goes for the bone-looking buttons on his ratty old coat. He wore old leather shoes that looked as if they were homemade. Good day, mate, he said. F*** me, mate. You gave us a f***ing heart attack, I said, officially shitting bricks. Where have you come from, my guy? Everything all right? Just over yonder. You lot aren't hunting around here, are you? Looking directly at the rifle. We might, yeah. Why? Mm, there's no hunting around here. Not enough deer as it is. Well, we hadn't decided on it. We're probably packing up anyway, I said as I edged my way towards that rifle. I should put this away anyway. I didn't mean to spook you, mate. I said looking for any excuse to get that rifle into my hands. It's all good. Guns don't spook me, he said. I didn't imagine they would. I picked the rifle up by the barrel and held it like a walking stick in an attempt to be non-confrontational, breathing a sigh of relief once it was in my hand. No offense, but you caught us by a bit of surprise. You gotta be the only one we've seen since we got here. Yeah, I saw you come in last night. I f***ing bet you did. I've been coming up here for about 40 years now. Beautiful spot, isn't it? Takes a bit to get down into the valley, huh? Yeah, mate. Look, no offense, but we're gonna hit the sack soon. Do you need a lift back to your camp? No, all good just out for a wander before I tuck in for the night. Saw the fire, and thought I'd say good day. Anyway, I'd better be on my way now. And with that, he turned and walked off, parallel to the river, into the dark, no torch. That was officially enough to spook us beyond any ability to calm down that night, and we decided to pack up in the dark and head out. Even if driving in the dark was a monumentally stupid idea in this part of the high country. We got into the truck and drove out, taking us along the valley floor. We didn't see a single fire, camp, a vehicle, nothing. We just kept on driving. Halfway home, Jess, who was obviously bored from the drive, flipped on the camera that we had in our pack, the one that we had been taking nature photos and pictures of the homestead with, but there was no memory card in it. What the fuck? 
after getting home and telling a few people what had happened. A friend's dad, an avid Bushman himself, was the one to officially freak us the hell out. Oh, you met the button man. The what now? I said. The button man. He's an old Bushman who goes out into the high country for months at a time, hunts with a spear, appears out of nowhere, scares people, has buttons made out of bone. There's a heap of people who've gone missing up that way. The cops keep looking, but they can't find a single trace. Campers, hikers. One camp was found burnt to the ground and a car left abandoned. They can't find any evidence at all. A quick Google confirmed it. The missing people, the button man, the lack of evidence. Police set out into the bush and found his camp. They spoke with him, but they have nothing else to go on. We were able to find an article that has some further info on the missing people and the mysterious button man himself. He's very real. Dozens have met him as he appears out of nowhere at their camp. But as for his connection to any of the missing people, well, only he knows that. We don't camp in that valley anymore. Hell, we don't camp that side of the high country anymore. Mainly because one meetup was enough. I can honestly say for both me and Jess, we'd rather not ever meet the button man ever again. Remember those early days of the internet? AOL software upgrades arrived in the mail on a CD-ROM. Family members often shouted across the house at one another if an incoming call on the landline interrupted the painstaking 10 minutes that it took to get from the America Online sign-in screen to hearing, you've got mail, reverberate throughout the room. Recipients of multicolored chain emails truly pondered the threat against their luck for the next seven years if they didn't abide by the message's command to forward it on to seven friends. Better not risk it, we told ourselves as we quickly typed out seven email addresses in the recipient field. And finding everything there was to know about a person online, something that anyone can do today with a few keystrokes and a credit card, was a lot harder to do back then. But not for Corey. I was 15 years old at the time, Ambiguous and exotic usernames like Pina Colada 33 or Brunette Baby 87 were all the rage. Naive as we early screen name pioneers were, this anonymity was smart. Social media was in its infancy. Zanga was the go to haven for teens and tweens to vent their angst while informing the world they were currently listening to Screaming Infidelities by Dashboard Confessional. Everyone was friends with Tom on MySpace. AOL Instant Messenger didn't exist as a standalone messenger service just yet, so it was MSN Messenger or Bust. But if you had a true AOL account like I did, you were set up with all you needed to discover this new, hyper-connected, free-for-all world of the early 2000s, World Wide Web. Your own email inbox, a new page to create a personal profile, access to chat rooms on just about any topic or hobby you could possibly imagine. It was exhilarating, until it was terrifying. One afternoon, I jumped into one of these random chat rooms. ASL, 16, female, Boston. I watched the usual exchange between total strangers scroll across my screen for several minutes, hoping to find my opportunity to finally chime in and introduce myself. Ultimately, I got bored and left the chat without typing a single word. When an instant message appeared on my screen. You didn't say anything, the message read. Why not? Who is this? I responded, confused by the username that I didn't recognize. I'm Corey, he responded. I'm 16, 8th grade, in Lake Charles, Louisiana. What about you? 16 and in the 8th grade? Yikes. And yet, I was intrigued. So, did you get held back twice, or what? I teased. And so the conversation began. We struck up a brief online friendship that afternoon. He shared a photo. Freckled face, 
brown hair, nothing I'd rate above a five on hot or not. Yet, despite the friendliness, I refused to tell him where I was from or anything personal about me beyond my first name and age. I knew little about the dangers of the internet, but I wasn't dumb either. My username was a fruity drink and some numbers, right? Safe enough is what I figured. For background, I did have one of those AOL user profiles. Its standard features included a profile picture and a questionnaire to fill out fun facts about yourself. My photo was one of me with several friends with no indication of which one was me whatsoever. A few days later, Corey messaged me out of the blue. You're beautiful. What? Brunettes with green eyes, man, he responded. Somehow, despite my photo containing three other friends, he'd accurately identified me. I would love to see you sometime. I felt my skin prick. I politely told him something to the effect of that not being possible and quickly logged myself off. Friday the following week, I was sleeping over at my best friend's house. I was logged into my account in the background as we thirstily browsed cute guys on Hot or Not. Who's messaging you? My friend asked. I knew it was Corey. Hey, you live in Houston. Your parents are Jim and Sarah, and you live at 1655 South Grand. Now, you know that feeling when you're on a roller coaster during a sharp drop and your heart jumps up into your throat? That was that moment. Fortunately, we managed to find that AOL did in fact have a block user feature that night. That was it. So long creepy 16 year old middle schooler with scarily good online sleuthing skills. Although that goodbye didn't last long. The next day, a screen name similar to Corey's messaged me. He had another account. I quickly blocked that one too. This happened no fewer than five more times. I finally went dark for a while. Sure, I missed the thrill of seeing the yellow envelope appear in my virtual mailbox, but it was better than the threat of being harassed by Corey. A few weeks later, I got home from school one afternoon. My little sister was a baby at that time, 14 years my junior so she had a nanny who stayed with her during the day while my parents were at work. When I walked through the kitchen door, the nanny handed me the phone. It's for you, she said with a quizzical look on her face. Who is it? I really don't know. Some boy with a twang in his voice. Sounds like he's from East Texas or Louisiana or something. Oh, God. Hello? I finally muttered into the phone. Hey, pretty thing. It's Corey. Hey, so my friends and I are all into the show Jackass. We're thinking of making a trip over to Houston and doing some pranks around town next week. How hilarious would it be if we surprised you at your front door? I choked out a nervous laugh, mumbled some excuse about having a quiz the next day, and quickly hung the receiver up. For the next few weeks, I slept with a kitchen knife under my mattress. I was absolutely terrified that I'd wake up to this Lake Charles stranger boy on the balcony outside of my window. How did he get my phone number anyway? But just as soon as he'd invaded my sense of security, he seemingly disappeared. No instant messages, no uninvited calls to my home. The knife finally went back to its respective kitchen drawer. Two months had passed, and it felt gloriously safe. Until the phone rang the first week of summer break. Hi. The voice said curtly. Who is this? I politely demanded. It's me, Corey. Now, let me be clear. This wasn't the same voice that I'd heard two months ago. That voice was dripping in southern syrup. It was young and full of mischief. This new voice was different. It was cold and lacked any discernible accent whatsoever. It was also much older. I knew that I was speaking to a grown man. I'm sorry I haven't been able to talk to you, he hurriedly blurted. Why did he sound so rushed? I just feel terrible, but the police came to my house. They took my computers away from me. I can't say why, but don't worry. I'll come to Houston soon. That was the last day I used that fruity username. 
I deleted that account and created a new one. I embarrassingly told my parents I'd made a huge mistake, despite having shared nothing that could have easily revealed my personal identity. Even if I had, the threat back then wasn't what it is now. This was almost 20 years ago. People simply didn't have the online presences that they do today. As a teenager with no social media yet, I was virtually a ghost. But still, I was convinced I was somehow culpable for this stranger, this man, a predator who clearly had advanced knowledge of computers and the internet, singling me out and making it his mission to learn everything about me through whatever means possible. He was determined to get to me. I'm only grateful that even at 15, I knew better than to trust that this freckle-faced kid from an online chat room had fully benign intentions. Two decades later, I still find myself wondering where Corey ended up. Hopefully, behind bars. I've been perusing this side of Reddit for quite some time now. But only today am I ready to stop being a lurker and contribute my story to the discourse. Living in a large metropolitan area such as London, I've unfortunately been accosted and assaulted a few times in my life. But nothing competes with your very first. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. This also happens to be the scariest instance of them all. I was eight years old at the time visiting my grandparents who lived in London. At that point, I didn't live here yet and was just visiting for the summer. I was on a day outing with my parents and our visiting American friend. Let's call her Laura. My dad grew up in London, so he wanted to take a sightseeing, and we had done the Tower of London, Trafalgar Square, and were wandering through the Oxford Street area, just window shopping. I remember trailing slightly behind my parents for just a moment, and looking into a busy cafe as I walked. It had a countertop bar where there were two large ladies perched on stools eating ice cream. All of a sudden, I remember watching these two ladies fall off the sides of their chairs and onto the floor, almost in slow motion. It was like a dream sequence, and I recall the music from the cafe sounding like it was underwater and slowed down, if even for just a moment. Except, they didn't fall to the floor. Actually, it was me. All I remember next is a huge shooting pain in my back and Laura screaming over me while I watched my mom sprinting away through the busy crowd forming full of shocked faces looking at me with concern. My dad was on his phone and I remember being particularly angry because mobile phones were new at the time and he was non-stop on his. I later found out that he was calling the police, not work. So what had actually happened, whilst I thought these fat ladies were falling off their chairs, was a homeless man in a heavy coat had emerged from the crowd, picked me up by the coat collar, and slammed my body down onto the pavement. My mom had immediately run after him, chasing him down a busy London street until he pulled a huge knife on her, and somehow she and three men nearby managed to disarm and hold the man until the police arrived, which apparently took no more than two minutes. At the time, I had absolutely no recollection of being attacked. I was excited to ride in an ambulance and a police car to go to the station. I asked to see a cell and remember getting given a pen by a police officer. I remember being in a bit of pain, but couldn't understand the fuss over me by the paramedic. But boy, did that pain really set in later on. I must have had some sort of adrenaline going on where I was in shock and feeling next to nothing. It's amazing how a child's mind works when it's in protection mode. As a side note, apparently I'd wake up screaming every night for months after this, saying that this man was in my room, according to my mom. I only remember it happening once, but even that is kind of striking. As a result of this attack, I had a cracked rib and several giant black bruises all over my chest and back from the impact of hitting the pavement and his grip. 
Even later in life, I can still remember his face quite clearly, and now I remember just how high he picked me up before throwing me down. This particular memory was triggered by receiving my birthday lumps as a teen, and it all came rushing back in the most bizarre way. What I didn't learn until my early adulthood shakes me to my core, and I can understand why my parents didn't share this with me as a child. Like I mentioned earlier, this man had a large knife that he obviously was not afraid to use. It turns out that he had been using that knife for quite some time, often victimizing others, and in certain situations, extinguishing their lives. He had even been so brazen as to assault another young girl the previous day, slashing her in the face while simply walking down the street. While the police were aware of this man and searching for him for months even, they were only able to apprehend him the day of my attack, thanks to the actions of my mom and those passerbys willing to help. I guarantee that that man didn't account for my slightly insane, yet fearless mama chasing him after he body slammed her little girl. Starting that day, he was no longer free to terrorize innocent people on the street. I don't know his name, and I don't know how long he went away for, but I personally hope that he's still locked away tight. Although I've resigned myself to never knowing for sure. All I can say, especially given the context with which I'm delivering this story, is that I pray to never meet that man again. I have two Australian shepherds. One is my personal dog, and the other is a foster. Both are roughly 70 pounds. I took them on a walk today at one of our local wilderness areas that consists of about 50 miles of trails in total. I've been there dozens of times with just my dog and never had any problems. Anyway, we're walking down the trail and these dogs do bark at a few people that we see. Every time I see someone, we step to the side off the trail and let them pass. I apologize to the people on behalf of the dogs most people generally smile and just keep on walking, and we all carry on. So when I see this one guy approaching, the dogs go into their alert mode, and we step off trail so he can pass. He practically gets right up next to us and stops before saying, Oh, I don't think your dogs like me. I tell him, No, they're just nervous. I apologize for them being so loud, and at this point, I'm holding them by their harnesses, so they're super close to me. But they're going absolutely bonkers. Angry barking, lunging, growling, the whole range. I know that's not great behavior, but nonetheless. He tells me, I'm sorry they don't like me. I'm so sorry. At this point, I'm weirded out because he's not broken eye contact and seems rather unfazed by the dogs. I again tell him it's okay, not his fault, and I tell the dogs, let's go, and begin to guide them away. We're pretty much past him at this point, when he calls out, saying that he's going to keep moseying up the trail. I say alright, and tell him to have a good day, and we walk off in opposite directions. I thought it was a strange interaction, but hey, we can all be a little weird, so I didn't dwell too much on it. About two minutes later though, I hear him call out from behind me, and I turn to see him rapidly approaching. He says, I just, I really want to be friends with your dogs. I don't want to leave them on bad terms, and I want to make friends, as he keeps walking up. When I come up on nervous dogs, I tend to leave them alone, or if I do try to make friends, I squat down, talk gently to them, extend a hand, things like that. He never did any of this though, and I swear, he never even looked at my dogs, because he kept his gaze trained on me the whole time. This time, the dogs are going absolutely nuts again, but I don't grab their harnesses. I let them have the full length of the leash to put some distance between us and that man. He keeps repeatedly saying that he just wants to be friends. I tell him I don't think it'll happen, and that my dogs just aren't there yet. 
He does try to approach still, but the dogs have none of that. He eventually says, I'm sorry, I don't think they're going to be friends with me. But again, he isn't even looking at the dogs. So I tell him affirmatively, no, they're not. And they won't be letting him get any closer. He finally turns and leaves. And I take out my phone to call my sister to keep me company for the remainder of the walk. So, is it annoying that my dogs freak out over the mailman or the neighbors or a knocking noise on a TV show? Yes. Yes, it is. I don't know for a fact that this man today had bad intentions, but I'm damn sure glad that they were there and made it abundantly clear he wasn't getting anywhere near me. I'll probably work with them on calming down quicker, but I have no plans to have them befriend strangers at first sight. And if ever your dogs, reactive or otherwise, give you that stiff, on-guard feeling when a stranger approaches, don't be so quick to explain it away. Don't try and disregard their senses. Those may very well keep you safe if they ever present themselves. Be safe, everybody. I am, and have been, a paramedic for about 10 years now. My entire career has been spent in emergency medicine, responding to 911 calls, and providing advanced life support for life-threatening illnesses and injuries. The calls that we respond to range from inappropriate use of an ambulance to being minutes away from death. And oftentimes, it's already too late. If you've heard any of my other stories here, then you know the background. But in 2014, I moved to another city a couple of hours away from home to work. The city was smallish, less than 100,000 people, but the ambulance serviced the entire county where the city resides. At the time, there was a significant oil boom in the area, so thousands of people flooded the city and county to work in the oil fields nearby. This caused the city to get a little rougher as you had people from all over the country moving there to work. And that many people in a small place increased the cost of living. With that, we saw a large increase in violent crimes, as well as traumatic injuries. We as paramedics worked 24-hour shifts, which weren't too bad on their own. The days were usually somewhat busy, and at night, the ambulance station had rooms with twin beds that allowed you to get some fairly decent sleep. Most of the calls that would classify as crazy, creepy, or scary, those tended to come at night. The day that this story takes place was a little different than normal. Normally, I get an EMT basic partner, which means since I'm the advanced provider on the truck, I get all of the patients. But today, I had another paramedic partner because we were training in a new hire paramedic. It was her first day in FTO, Field Training Orientation. This means we generally let her take the calls and sit back and evaluate her performance to ensure she's capable and doesn't kill anyone. This was her first job after graduation, so she was still pretty green. I could see she was very nervous and trying her hardest to do her best. So, as per usual, the day was pretty busy, but as it began to wind down, I was getting ready to attempt to take a nap. I kick off my boots and lay down on the bed, on top of the covers, because it's easier to get up that way if and when a call comes in. I put my radio up by my head, full volume, like always, so I can be sure to wake up if we get a call. Sure enough, as midnight rolls around, I hear a call go out. Dispatch says, man who has been stabbed is not breathing. Luckily, it's not my call, and another ambulance responds, so I go back to bed, or at least try to. About 30 minutes later, another call goes out, and this time, it's for me. Dispatch information. Man with a knife wound on his hands. Police are already on scene. I sit up, get my boots on, wake up the new girl and my partner, and we all walk out to the ambulance. The area of the call was right smack dab in the middle of downtown. We responded non-emergent 
as it was not a life-threatening injury. As we arrive on scene, there's around six police cars already on the block, all with their lights on. The area itself was through an alleyway and behind a building just off of the main street. As we pull up, there are a number of officers, a couple sheriff's deputies, and a detective, all standing around this man with a rag on his hand. As I got closer, I could see the man was bald, middle-aged, and had almost a homeless look to him. He also had a big dark spot right in the middle of his forehead. One of the officers approached me to fill me in on what was going on before I talked to the guy and begin treatment on him. The officer tells me the man has a large laceration on the back of his hand that he received from a knife. At this point, I was still a bit groggy and didn't quite put two and two together. The officer says the man said he was attacked by another man and that he is probably going to need stitches. So, as it's not serious, I have the training paramedic approach first to begin her assessment and give me her treatment plan. I stay close behind her and we both walk up to the man who is in handcuffs. As we approach, the dark spot on the guy's forehead is now clear. On the center of his forehead, stretching from his eyebrows and what would have been his hairline, is the biggest swastika tattoo that I have ever seen. My FTO begins to talk to the man as I stand back and observe. Something about the man's general composure and responses absolutely chilled me. When we first walked up, the man was muttering something underneath his breath. I couldn't tell what he was saying, but he was repeating it over and over again. My FTO asked police to uncuff him to see the cut on his hand more clearly. At this point, one of the other officers produced the knife he believed to be the weapon that caused the injury. The knife was in an evidence baggie, and it was covered in blood. The knife itself was nothing special. It just looked like a cheap plastic pocket knife, like you would buy at some cheesy gift shop. It was a folding knife with a black plastic handle, and a blade that was no more than three inches long, with a bit of serration towards the handle. The man showed us his hand, on the back, cutting right through another large swastika tattoo, was a laceration that went from the base of his pinky finger to the lower fleshy part of the thumb. It was quite wide also, approximately three centimeters, exposing the bone of his metacarpals as well as tendons. The bleeding had mostly stopped with pressure from the towel he was holding onto. When my partner asked the man what had happened, the man then repeated to us what he had been repeatedly muttering to himself. I killed him, man. He's a dead man. I had to have killed him. He's got to be dead. At this point, I'm starting to put it together and understanding the larger picture. We get the man into the ambulance so we can assess for any further injuries that we may not see under his clothing. After a thorough search, we realize there are no other injuries, so we begin to transport him to the hospital. My FTO bandaged the man's hand, and as we're driving, I start to ask questions to try to figure out the details. The man told me everything I wanted to know, and never lost that chilling vibe, staring distantly as he recounted what had happened. The man told me that he is homeless, and was wandering around when a friend offered him a ride. He says that he was leery of the man, but decided to get in anyway and accept the offer. The man said the friend began asking him if he hated The man said he didn't and that he wasn't racist. He tells me this is when his friend became upset with him and tried to stab him with a pocket knife. The man said he attempted to defend himself, managed to wrestle the knife away from his friend and stabbed him back before jumping out of the car and running. So, with this shocking telling of the tale, we continue to transport the man in silence. Also, as a side note, an officer rode in the ambulance with us the whole way. After we dropped the man off at the ER, we all kind of sat there shocked leaving the hospital. We returned to the ambulance station and tried to get some sleep. However, none of us were destined for sleep this evening. 
an hour later, we get another call for a body removal from downtown, less than three blocks away from our last call. We pull up to the area, which is the middle of the street. The street itself is blocked off 100 feet on both sides by a fire truck and police cars. The fire truck was equipped with a double stack of four halogen lights, risen up on the ladder, shining down to illuminate the area. Walking up with the stretcher and body bag, the detective on scene tells us they are done with the investigation to the medical examiner's office. At this point, we're about 50 feet away from where the body lay. From where we are, I can see the person lying in the middle of the street. We get closer and take a few minutes to examine the body. What I see, and putting together what I was told, is astonishing to say the least. The man, another middle-aged man, appears white, possibly Latin, laying in the middle of the street on his back, with his arms spread eagle and his legs straight out. There's a vehicle parked on the side of the road, with its driver's side door still open. I figured that must be this guy's vehicle. It was parked neatly, not haphazardly or incorrectly. The deceased man has streaks of blood coming from his nose and mouth, with several small puncture wounds on his face and cheeks. Looking at his torso, there are about a dozen more knife-shaped puncture wounds in his chest and abdomen. Most of the wounds were so jagged and barbaric looking, you could see fatty tissue pushing out of them. There wasn't much of a blood puddle under the man, but a very long trail of blood ran from the man to the side of the street where the curb was. The blood then continues its flow another 10 feet along the curb before spilling into a storm drain. With that much blood loss, the man had exsanguinated and bled out there in the middle of the street. We packaged the man into the body bag and transported him to the ME's office. When we got back to the station, my charge medic told me that the officer that rode with the first patient requested that we fill out a report on what we heard the man say. Thankfully, the rest of that shift was rather uneventful. From that night, I'm going to fast forward about a year. I received a call from the state's attorney. He asked me, if I remembered this call, to which I informed him that I did. He told me that the first patient from that evening is going to trial for murder, that that man is pleading not guilty, and that the attorney would like to go over my statement with me as I would be a key witness and require my testimony in court. We went over my statement and we talked about it a bit. Then he told me he would be in touch and wished me a good day. A few days later, he calls me back up again and informs me that the man has changed his plea to self-defense and that I was needed in court in a week. Literally a day before the trial, the attorney calls me up again. He tells me this time the man changed his plea to guilty and I would be no longer needed. I don't know what happened after that. I never really looked into it. It's just another brick in the wall, so to speak. A story filed away in my brain, probably never to be forgotten. Another story about encountering somebody on possibly the worst day of their life, or in other cases, the last day of someone's life. We had an older couple that lived next door to us when I was growing up. They didn't have any kids and never had any family over to visit or anything. Just the two of them. The guy was a little quirky, but he was retired and just liked to stay busy, so he would do things like go out and find a broken bike someone had put by the curb or something electronic, then take the junk back to his place and try to fix it in his shed in the backyard. He truly was one of those one-man's-trash type of guys and just liked fixing things. He would do all this in his little red shed in the middle of his backyard that had a full workshop in it. Once a year, our block would get together and do a whole weekend where we did a big yard sale and people could come walk house to house looking over stuff. And it actually got a good amount of people since it was in the early 90s then. 
and you couldn't just pop on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace for some used stuff. I ran a little lemonade stand myself to get in on it as well. So this old guy was in his backyard a lot, hiding out in the shed, fixing whatever prize he had brought home that day. The only window on that shed faced our backyard. Whenever I would go out to play in the backyard, I would hear growling and roaring come from the shed. I was very young back then, probably five or six, so I would get curious about the noise and go up to the fence, pushing my face up against it, staring at the shed while it was making all of these crazy noises. At some point, the man had come out and told me that he has a tiger in his shed. That was where it lived, and that's why I kept hearing it. I'm like five, so of course I think it's the coolest thing ever that my neighbor has a tiger. So every time I hear it, I would run over to the fence and try to watch for that tiger, even though the small window on the side of the shed had blinds on it and I wasn't seeing in. Obviously, I eventually grew up enough to start questioning this. Plus, me and my mom had walked over there one day and the old guy's wife sent us out back to the shed to ask if he could fix something for us. I got to see inside then and realized there was no tiger and that he was just messing around with me the whole time. But I did see that his work desk was directly under the window. I never thought anything of it. Just some nice old guy who liked tinkering in his shed. My mom would also send me over to their house sometimes when they said that they had something for me. I'd go over and that man and his wife would be in the living room just watching TV. There they would hand me a bag with like two handfuls of candy in it. Sometimes they would give me a bag of tacos for my dad. This man's wife was Hispanic and made some absolutely amazing authentic tacos. I'd sit down for a few minutes and they would ask me how I liked school or if I was doing well. Stuff you would talk to a kid about. After a couple of minutes of this, they would send me home. It seemed normal to me as a kid because it happened weekly. Sometimes, that man would even give me a toy that he had fixed. Outside looking in, sounds like this completely normal old couple that was just super nice and neighborly. But soon after, another family moved in down the street. This family was made up of a husband and a wife and a three-year-old baby girl. And the wife was rather paranoid. She went house to house and met everyone on the block when she moved in. Then, she checked to see if anyone she just met was a registered sex offender. I grew up in the 90s, and I was a kid at this point, so I don't know if this behavior was completely normal or if it was weird. But come to find out, this lady's paranoia wasn't misleading. The guy neighbor that had been watching me grow up all these years giving me candy, fixing toys, turned out to have multiple child molestation charges against him. No one in our neighborhood knew. And back then, the internet wasn't exactly in every house, so getting information like that would have been on the person trying to find out. What this woman learned, she shared with my parents all of the information she got. I was no longer allowed anywhere near those people, even though I was too old for it to matter, being basically a teenager now. I think back on all the weird crap that we accepted as normal and just how much time I spent watching for the tiger. My skin crawls, just wondering what was going on in that shed, what was causing all that roaring and growling I was enamored with. It also makes sense why that couple never had any visitors or children around. No family coming by, even on the holidays. The wife had grown up children, but they never came by. If her kids had kids of their own, they may have known not to drop by. It's really creepy knowing that no matter how much you know your neighbors, you actually don't know your neighbors at all. I. A 24-year-old female was at the gym just doing cardio on the treadmill. It was pretty empty there, not very many people on a Thursday afternoon. 
I always use the treadmills in front of the mirrors so I can pay attention to my surroundings like a safe young woman should. I was on a treadmill two away from the end, and all of them were empty, save for one at the opposite end of where I was. This man gets on the treadmill right next to me, which is weird in and of itself, but okay. I had my headphones on, and I'm watching Criminal Minds, but every so often I look up at the mirrors just to check my surroundings, and every time I glance up, this man is staring at me. Around 37 minutes in to my 45 minutes of planned cardio, this guy drops his phone off the side of his treadmill, closest to me. I was watching in the mirror as it happened and he basically threw it down next to me. That's when he gets off the treadmill, picks his phone up, and then taps me on the shoulder. Now, at no point during this interaction did I take my headphones out, so I couldn't really hear what he was saying. I did hear that he introduced himself, although I didn't quite catch his name. And then he asked me my name. I gave a fake one, all the while still focusing on my workout. He then said something else, but I couldn't decipher it because Derek Morgan got into a shootout. I just nodded and returned to my show, clearly uninterested in whatever he had to say to me. At this point, I only had like five minutes left, but once again, every time I looked in the mirror, he was looking directly at me. I finished my workout and went to the stretching area that is near the treadmills, still in front of the mirrors. I also took a glance at how long he'd been on the treadmill, and it was something like 8 minutes, so not actually long enough to be a real workout, or honestly even a warm-up. When I moved to the stretching area, he moved to the closest machine, all the while still staring at me. Using the mirror, I started counting his sets and reps, so in the middle of his next set, I got up and left, thinking this would give me enough time to get to my car and leave before he even noticed I was gone. I walked out the front doors of the gym with a little speed to my steps. Not quite a run, but definitely not lingering any longer than I needed to. I beeped my car to open the doors for me, got to my driver's side, and went to sit down. In the half second between starting the car and reaching for my seatbelt, my passenger side door is flung wide open. I dart my eyes over just in time to see Jim Guy leaning down, looking at me, and attempting to swing a leg into my car as if he wants to sit shotgun. I instinctively yell, don't f touch my car, as I throw my car into drive and quickly floor it out of the spot with both doors still wide open and Jim Guy laying on the ground in response to how fast I pulled out. For those wondering, yes, my pullout game is strong. And yes, I back into parking spots because I read an article one time that said it was the safest thing to do if there was ever a need to flee quickly. I made it out of the parking lot and a half mile down the road with my passenger side door still open before I felt safe enough to pull over and close it. All the while, doing my best to make sure I wasn't followed out by treadmill bro. The next day, I went back to the gym to report this guy, but like I said earlier, I never got his name, and the gym didn't want to look at the cameras with me present. They said that once they figured out who it was, they would talk to him, which left me feeling as if they weren't going to do a thing about the situation. So, after dwelling on this incident for another night, I canceled my membership to that gym and don't ever plan on going back. I don't know what that guy's plans were, or why he would even entertain the thought that jumping into my car was a good idea. And it sketches me out to think, what if I didn't respond the way that I did? What skews me out just as much is that I told my gym what happened, gave them the info I had, and they pretty much just waved me away. After this experience, I decided not to go back, and have since found a better spot to work out, but what about the next girl that this happens to? Will she have to endure something much worse because the gym didn't take any kind of action when they could? I don't know, 
but I certainly hope not. This story isn't so much creepy, just absolutely terrifying. This happened when I was 18 or 19 years old and living on my own for the very first time. As a freshman in college, our days consisted of going to class in the mornings, then getting Chipotle, then going back to the apartment and smoking weed for the rest of the day or night. Nearly every single day was like that. Actually, no, not nearly. That was exactly what we did every single day. Me and my roommate, let's call him James, had a close friend from high school who'd stay with us pretty often. Let's call him Tyler. Tyler would come over to smoke at our apartment regularly since we had a safe place to do so and this was away from his parents' house where he was living at the time. One night, Tyler was over and we were smoking per usual and decided to go on a walk around the apartment complex. It wasn't late at all, maybe 8 p.m. As we were walking, a pair of guys who looked to be a little bit older than us approached and asked us if we had any weed. James, who was the dullard of our group, immediately said something along the lines of, yeah, we can get you some. Tyler and I were already in the process of saying no when he blurted that out to them, as we lived in a state where you actually had to be really careful about having weed. Next thing we know, James has invited the two randos into our apartment to smoke with us, despite our discontent with the situation. Remember, we are 18 and 19 at the time, high and overall just stupid as hell. So the two guys come into our apartment, we smoke, and the whole time, they're just being really weird. One of the guys keeps making jokes that he's an undercover cop, saying stuff like, notice how I'm not inhaling all the way? Undercover cops can smoke weed, so long as they don't inhale, then it's fine. Now, in retrospect, these guys were just a little older than us and were totally f***ing with us by saying stuff like that, but it freaked both Tyler and myself out. So much so, that after the two guys left, we insisted on going and hiding our bags of weed before the inevitable police raid rained down on us. Disclaimer. I know we were stupid for actually thinking that they were cops, but we didn't know any better at the time. We were paranoid, and all we could think about was the possibility of getting a misdemeanor weed conviction, which carried a thousand dollar fine and one year probation. Well, let me just say, those two guys do not end up being the creepy part of this encounter. Tyler and I, in a state of weed-induced paranoia, decided to go hide our backpack full of weed in the woods outside of the apartment complex until we could confirm that our apartment would not be raided. By this point, it's probably about 1.30 a.m. So, we set off on our journey into the woods, hide the weed, and identify a few landmarks to ensure that we can find it again, because God forbid we lose that ounce of weed. We feel a lot better after hiding the evidence and set back off towards the apartment. We re-enter the complex, and are walking along content with ourselves, back towards my unit. As we're rounding the corner to my building, I hear the swishy sound of athletic pant legs sweeping together, as if somebody's running up behind us. Before we can even turn around, we hear a deep voice yell from behind, Get on the ground. I turn around long enough to see a masked man pointing a pistol right at us. We both immediately hit the deck, as he screams at us to give him all of our money. We were 18 year olds and weren't exactly carrying large amounts of cash on us. We emptied our pockets, but all we had were our cell phones and empty wallets. The man became increasingly angry and told us to get up, but to stay facing away from him. Now, this was obviously already a scary situation, but this is when it got extremely terrifying for the both of us. Just a couple of days before this, two teens had been brutally murdered in our area in the same fashion, forced to face away from their killer, and ultimately shot execution style in cold blood. And they hadn't caught the guy yet. It was all either of us could think about in that moment, as it was a highly publicized crime that everyone in our area had heard about. 
I know I'm totally putting my general location out there right now, but I know people are going to want to know what case I'm referring to. Plus, neither of us live in that area or even that state anymore. So Google Jeffrey Hazelwood murders for more context. The happy ending to our story? The guy proceeds to instruct us to walk. He walks behind us all the way to the exit of the apartment complex. And as we exited, we heard the sound of running again, but this time away from us. We slowly turn around and realize that he's gone, but we were still so freaked out that we kept walking and called a friend to come pick us up from a nearby Waffle House. To this day, I'm so glad that only psychological rather than physical harm was dealt to us on that night. Oh, and by the way, we went back to the woods first thing the next morning and picked up the backpack in order to continue our era of stoner degeneracy. So I, a 23-year-old male, am a broke college student, and I thought I could start a handyman business to make a little money while I'm in school. I posted an ad on Craigslist advertising my skills, my fix-it slash construction-related skills. Anyhow, I quickly get a message from a guy who wants me to fix his cash register and stereo. I drive over to the address he provided and fix the cash register fairly easily. Turned out, it was just a broken spring, so no biggie there. But while I'm in his presence, he wants me to help him to rewind a VHS tape. First red flag there, because who still uses a VCR anyway? But as he explained the situation, it didn't seem like this was going to be a major thing either, because his direct quote was, I can't see the rewind button. After strolling up to the machine and looking it over for less than two seconds, I locate the button that he's needing and press it in. I push the button with two back arrows on it and I'm more than just a little shocked when the video plays on the TV in reverse. It happens to be some guy on guy vintage porn. I try not to make the guy feel any kind of way. I figured it was just an accident and I'm not here to judge anyway. I chatted with the guy for a few minutes and said I would take the stereo home to see if I could fix it. So I got paid for the cash register and left. But the moment I got home, I checked my email and found this message. Hope you weren't insulted by the film I turned on. I had forgotten I even had it as I threw my whole library from our video store away. I really get turned on by large morning wood like that. Anyhow, feel free to come over anytime. I think I can make it worth your while. That message, followed by this one. I'm really anxious to see you again. Whenever you want to come over, late afternoons or around this time are always good for me. Discreet and $40 for maybe 20 minutes or so of your time. The next message, I would really like to treat you to a very special skill of mine. No reciprocation and you won't be sorry. When I didn't respond to any of the previous messages, I get one that simply says, Interested? At this point, I wasn't sure what to respond with. Like, I've got to return the stereo too, but I'm not going to even try and fix it. Who knows what I'll find if I even open that thing up. I'm so glad I used my Google voice number, but I'm very sorry that I had told him where I lived when I first introduced myself. I decided then to park my car far away from my dorm. The dorm itself is a converted motel. I told my girlfriend about what was going on. She just thought it was funny and said, now you know why I don't like going outside at night. After devising a plan, I drove over to his house early in the morning, dropped off the stereo without any contact, and sprinted back to my car before hightailing it out of there. Once far, far away from his spot, I responded to his messages with this. Hi, my bad. I wasn't aware of what you were getting at with your previous question. However, I'm going to stick with the services I posted in the ad and nothing further. I returned the radio to your garage and I don't wish to do any further business with you. 
Best of luck to you in all of your pursuits. While I effectively ended any business relationship with my actions and message, I still get the odd message every now and again from a random number that says, are you ready to hang out yet? While I can't be sure, I know it's him. And no, definitely not ready to hang out, bro. This happened to me when I was just 13. For a little background that led to this, I had just switched to a new school that was further away from home. And now instead of just taking one bus, I had to take a bus, a train, and then another bus to get there. With my now longer commute, I had to leave my house around 6.45 a.m. if I wanted to get to first period at 8.30 a.m. For the most part, I was never worried about safety since public transit was busy in the morning. As I got off the train, I had to cross a big bridge in order to reach the area with the different bus routes. There were three major ones, but it didn't matter which one I got on, as they all passed the school before breaking off into separate directions. So one morning, as I was waiting for one of the buses to show up, this random construction worker, also waiting for a bus, started talking to me. He looked to be in his mid-thirties. I didn't think much of it, as I was easy to have a conversation with. I started seeing him more frequently at the bus stop, and I began to find it a bit strange because he would always compliment me. He'd say I had a cool bag or a nice jacket at first, but he never said anything to explicitly raise any red flags. Things started to get weird pretty quickly though, and he would start complimenting me on my features, saying that I had pretty eyes or a cute smile. I was beginning to get a bit uncomfortable, but again, I brushed it off and chose to start avoiding him to the best of my abilities. I never thought too much of my own safety, as there were always people around, and I had a cell phone in case I had to call my parents or the police. I didn't see the guy for a few days, so I began to think I was in the clear and started to forget all about him. But that's when things really began to escalate. I was sitting by myself with my earbuds in, when suddenly someone tapped my shoulder and sat down beside me. It was the guy, and now he's talking to me like we're old friends. I was really uncomfortable, did my best to try to dismiss him, and went to walk away to the other side of the bus area. But that's when he said something that really caught me off guard. He just casually turns to me like it's nothing, and says, What would you do if I tied you up and never let you go? I was genuinely shocked. I got up from the bench and started walking away. But he too got up and started to follow behind me. That's when two buses pulled in. He of course followed me onto the bus that I chose, but I wasn't having any of that. So I got right off and hopped onto the second one. If he followed me on again, I was going to tell the bus driver I needed help. But thankfully, it didn't come to that. I was so damn confused. I went to school and the first thing I did was tell my friends what happened. I really didn't understand the severity of the situation at first because, because not only was I 13 years old, but I'm a guy. I didn't think these things happened to guys. As I was telling the story, I was kind of downplaying it because nothing bad had actually happened in my eyes and there were no real repercussions. Everyone gave me the same dumbfounded stare as no one knew what to say. Then, one of the teachers overheard me, which I'm not surprised about. I was a loud kid. And in a look of shock, that teacher brought me to the principal's office. So I missed the entirety of first period that day, explaining what happened to the principal and to a police officer. They informed my parents, who at first were really confused on why I didn't mention anything about the weird guy before. I was driven to school the next few days until a police officer came over to talk to me and my parents. He said that they found the guy on the transit cameras and were able to track him down and talk to him. There wasn't too much the officer could do aside from telling him to stay away from me, since the guy technically didn't do anything illegal. The officer did tell me that they would be monitoring the train station around that time as well, and that if the guy ever approached or talked to me again, to call 911 directly. 
I saw the guy like two or three more times after, but he never spoke to me or even looked at me, which I'm truly thankful for. I'm just glad nothing major came from it. But this event definitely played a part in me being more aware in public from then on. A little bit of backstory for this one. I had just finished high school and had recently turned 18 when all of this occurred. I was looking forward to starting university and was going to be moving out of my parents' house into student housing closer to campus. As a result, I started looking for work closer to where I lived. I found a job about a five minute walk from where I was going to be living and that was perfect for me. I was to be a barista in a tiny little coffee kiosk on one of the coolest streets in our city. This street was sort of known for prostitution and drugs, but it was also super popular as it hosted some of the most interesting events and also contained some of the nicest thrift stores in the city. What was even more ideal about my new job was the fact that I worked right across the street from my best friend. We'll call her Phoebe. At the time, Phoebe was in love with her job. She was actively being given more responsibilities, and she was being promised the world by her employers. Many of these promises turned out to be false, but at the time, the opportunities loomed large above her head. During one of her shifts, Phoebe was approached by a man who had seemingly become a regular at the place that she was working. We'll call him Richard. He told her that if she ever wanted to leave her job, he had just become the manager of a new restaurant a little way down the road. Phoebe kindly denied his offer. He approached her several more times with the same offer before she recommended another close friend of ours for the job. We'll call her Mia. Mia was hesitant to take the position at first because she had a passionate hatred for hospitality and greatly preferred retail, although she needed the extra money at the time, so she took the role. The day that Mia was signing her contract, Phoebe and I both finished work early, around 4 p.m., so we told Mia that we would meet her at her new job once we finished, and then we would go do something fun afterwards. Phoebe and I went to the cake shop next door and sat outside her work while we waited for Mia. Once they finished, Richard followed Mia outside to come and say hi to Phoebe. The girls introduced him to me, and conversation ensued. He seemed like a friendly guy, if not just a little bit awkward. He was late 30s, early 40s, bird-like in appearance quite short, bald, larger in size, and he seemed to be, I don't know, greasy? As the conversation continued, I began to tease Mia a little bit, as friends are known to do. I saw no harm in it, as she was one of my best friends and she had made a similar joke at my expense prior to this interaction. Richard's demeanor suddenly seemed to shift. He became somewhat catty in defense of Mia. He retorted back that if I was going to be mean to his staff, that he would bar me from every store on the street that we worked on. This seemed ridiculous, but he claimed to be friends with the security guard that worked on the street. I was actually friends with that man, and when I asked him about it, he told me that he had never heard of Richard before. Richard said these things to me as though he was joking, but he was so very persistent about it that I got incredibly uncomfortable and felt tears start to swell into my eyes. It was from this interaction that he nicknamed me Trouble. I also feel it needs to be noted that he didn't scold Mia or Phoebe at all for the same behavior. Phoebe sensed my discomfort and told him that we had to leave as we had previous plans. Flash forward a few weeks, Phoebe and I decide to go see Mia at work again. Richard intrudes on our conversation once more, and again he singles me out from the group teasing me and only referring to me as trouble. This time, I just play along as I can tell that it isn't going to stop. He asks Mia if she is after another job as he needs someone to clean his home and lives all the way out where my parents and Mia live. Mia tells him she can't as she has too many responsibilities as it is, but I tell him that I might know a few people in the area that might do it. As a means of communication for this job, I give him my phone number. Richard takes this as a sign that I have agreed to do it and begins texting me incessantly about setting up a meeting. 
This man is much older than me and lives alone in a rather rural area. Suddenly, my instincts kick in and I try to get out of it by telling him I can't drive. He then says that he'll pick me up from the nearest train station. I don't want to come across as impolite or have my best friend's boss resent her because of me, so I make the mistake of agreeing. However, I tell him that my sister will be helping me as she is looking for a part-time job and my dad will be dropping us off. I do this in order to have some backup and so that my dad knows my whereabouts. Richard goes on to complain about how I don't trust him and claims that his house is very small and the $100 he is going to pay me won't be enough to split with my sister. I tell him that I just want to provide her with work experience and then he finally agrees, asking how old she is. My sister is 17. Richard and I finally find a time that I'm not working to schedule a meeting. This meeting is held at his place of work and I feel a lot more comfortable sitting in the main restaurant surrounded by people, as I thought he was going to hold the meeting in a back office. We begin to speak about the responsibilities of the job. He tells me it'll be basic things like tidying up, vacuuming, typical spot cleaning. I agree. He then goes on to tell me that he will also be expecting me to do his laundry. I think this is a bit odd, as he's only paying a small amount for what's quickly becoming a large job. He assures me his house is small and not that messy, but continuously claims that it just needs a woman's touch. I nod and ignore the fact that this grown man thinks that just because he's a man, it means he doesn't need to know how to maintain his own home. Now, this is where things start to get creepy. Near the end of the meeting, he asks me again how old my sister is, and when I say 17, his face visibly drops. He starts telling me about how he previously posted this ad on Craigslist, and this 60-year-old woman replied offering to do it in her lingerie. He tells me how he didn't even ask for that in the ad, but she offered, and he was put off completely. He then proceeds to tell me that he would be willing to pay more to someone between the ages of 18 and 30 if they were willing to do that, but he would never request it because he wasn't a pervert. I call bullshit on that and tell him then and there that the meeting is done and I have to go meet Phoebe. He asked me if he made me uncomfortable. Well, yes you did, but I just say no, and that I'll get back to him. This strange man who I've only met three times then attempts to hug me, but I ignore the gesture completely and awkwardly wave goodbye from less than three feet away. I hoof it down the street to Phoebe's work and tell her the entire story. She tells me I can't do it, and I tell her I know, but I don't know how to tell him that without risking my own safety or Mia's job. Fortunately, Richard gives me the perfect out. He texts me later that afternoon, telling me he hopes that I'm okay with cats because he has a small one. I see this as the perfect opportunity and lie to him, telling him that my sister and I are both deathly allergic to cats and neither of us will be open to doing the job. Richard accepts this reasoning after a little persuasion, and I think I'm finally done with him. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Richard proceeded to text me every day, asking if I was mad at him, or if he made me uncomfortable, asking me how my day was, things like that. Just behaving like a middle schooler in a new relationship, basically. The more I ignored him, the more he texted. I finally blocked him in March of that year. This whole escapade, had begun about four or five months prior to this. The blocking still didn't stop him though. Mia informed me that Richard was no longer going to be working there as he had to go for surgery and we wouldn't have to see him anymore. See, Richard hadn't only been harassing me, but both Mia and Phoebe too, just to a lesser extent. One Saturday morning while I was working, setting up at around 7.45 a.m., Richard showed up at my work. The security divider was still down as we were closed, so we came and stood in the doorway, which was the only exit I had available to me at the time. He started asking me why I was ignoring him and telling me about his surgery. I told him he wasn't allowed to stand there as it was a fire exit, but he didn't budge. Fortunately, my boss showed up shortly afterwards and told Richard he was going to phone security if he didn't move. 
I'm sure my boss recognized the sheer look of fear on my face. This man was usually an ass on most days, but holy sh** was I grateful for him that morning. Roughly a month after that experience, I thought Richard was gone from my life. I was living in my brand new apartment, Mia was around all the time, and loved her job without Richard being there. Things were going well for us. One morning, after a night of drinking, me and the flatmates became a bit peckish. I decided to order us some greasy food on a food delivery app, when lo and behold, it is none other than Richard that's our delivery driver. I turn to my boyfriend at the time and tell him he has to go collect the food. He doesn't understand, but Mia assures him that it's important. He agrees and heads out to collect it. Richard is not driving the vehicle that he claims to be driving on the app, and at first we're a bit confused, as the number plate is also different. Mia and I watch from my boyfriend's bedroom window, and the interaction takes much longer than expected. He eventually comes back in, and we ask him what took so long. He tells us that Richard refused to give him the food until he could prove that he was indeed my boyfriend. Richard had recognized my name from the app, and now he knew where we lived. Mia and I tell my flatmates the story of what happened, and we all agree it's a good idea to go to my RA. The resident advisor reports it to upper management, and they say they can't really do anything about it, but if Richard comes back again, to call their security. A few months go by, and there are no Richard sightings until I order from the same app once more. Yet again, Richard is our driver. And yet again, in a different car. Just like last time, I send my boyfriend to go and get the food. I report the incident to my RA and the food delivery app itself. I know I was stupid in not immediately reporting it to campus security, as I had much more proof of the creepy behavior than he had of his own innocence. But I was naive, and I didn't want my parents to find out at the time. Fortunately, I haven't seen Richard since, and for future reference, Richard, let's not meet ever again. This story takes place back in 1991 in the Southeast United States. And before you start to wonder, no, not Florida. I was fresh out of a relationship, living on my own in an area where I didn't have much family or many friends. And to add on to things, I had just given birth to my son the day before. My son is the product of the relationship that had just ended. And it ended due to the fact that his father simply didn't want to be a father. A little late for that in my book, but I wasn't going to force anyone to do anything they didn't want to do. I'd figure out how to make it on my own. So there I was in the hospital, recovering after giving birth, and also after losing a fair amount of blood in the process. In case there are any questions about this, childbirth isn't always smooth and easy. In fact, it's really not either one of those things in most situations. I was resting, but remember getting up and moving around a little bit that day, so I couldn't have been too dopey. My son was sleeping in his bassinet next to my bed peacefully. We were both trying to nap when a nurse that I hadn't seen before in my two days at the hospital quietly came into my room and, without acknowledging me one bit, grabbed a hold of one end of the bassinet and slowly started to pull it away. I jerked almost upright in my bed, grabbed the other end of the bassinet, and said, What are you doing? This must have startled this woman, because after a split second of awkward quiet, she said that she was taking him for his blood tests. Now, I happen to be a registered nurse, and I knew what sorts of things they do to newborns. Even more, I knew that my son had already had his full panel of tests done. I emphatically pointed to the band-aid on his heel and said, he's already had his tests, so what tests are you talking about? Again, a moment of pause before she muttered something about not being sure what kinds of tests, but that she was sure that some tests were needed. At no point did I take my hand off that bassinet. I held fast, because not only did I not like her answers, her entire presence and vibe had me on guard. I felt a heaviness and tenseness in this room that wasn't there at any point before she walked through the door. 
This woman wore a purple-pink set of scrubs, was white, likely in her early 40s, and had long burgundy or dark red painted nails that clung to my baby's resting place in a way that made me just as uneasy as her whole aura did. That's when I remember saying, rather forcefully actually, well, when you find out what tests he needs, you can let me know. Until then, you're not taking my son. She didn't respond with a single word, but she also didn't let go of his bassinet right away. We were locked in a staring contest for what felt like minutes, although I'm sure now that it was no more than five to ten seconds. Finally, her hold of his bassinet relented, and just as quietly as she came into the room, she slunk out. And as she exited the room, that would be the last time that I saw her. I must have still been a little bit out of it, because once she left, I didn't think to use the call button to get another nurse or doctor to come by. I kind of just sunk back into rest mode. But when the time for my afternoon check-in came with the nurse that I was under the charge of, I asked her about the other lady that had come into my room. I described her as best as I could and asked what extra tests they needed to run on my baby boy. That's when my nurse's pleasant demeanor shifted to one more filled with concern. She told me that baby boy's blood work had come back perfectly, and there was no order to take more blood. That's what I had thought. But the real shock was when she told me that this particular floor of the hospital only had three nurses on duty currently, and none of them fit the description that I just gave her. She called hospital security, and they came to talk to me. After speaking with the officer on duty, he explained that he would look at the security footage and get back to me with anything that he found. But after learning that a non-medical professional, or more likely, somebody posing as one, just attempted to remove my son from my possession, I no longer felt safe in that hospital. I asked to be discharged a whole day earlier than what doctors were advising. Now, I'll say that when most people see a nurse walk into their hospital room, they tend to just let them do whatever they're there to do. The idea is that the nurse wouldn't be bothering me if they didn't have to. They're just doing their jobs. But I knew not to be so complacent. In our area at the time, there were several instances of babies being abducted by imposters dressed in uniforms. People that came in and from under the noses of parents and professionals simply walked off with infants. Some of these people were caught. Some of them were not. I'll never know for sure, but I absolutely feel like we dodged a bullet that afternoon. My son is now upwards of 30 years old. He's happy, healthy, has a family of his own. But no matter how old he gets, he will always be my baby boy. Mine, not that lady's. My story takes place in Fayetteville, North Carolina, near Fort Bragg, where I went to college four years ago. As anyone who is familiar with the area knows, Fayetteville has a large population of homeless vets near the base, also known locally as Fayette Nam. I had just turned 20 years old and had moved out of the house for college over two hours away. I had previously worked at a nursing home for two years, so I have a special place in my heart for the struggling elderly. My roommate and I had moved into a little apartment near the college and bought a rinky-dink washer and dryer set, used. Well, the washer didn't last for a whole week before it burnt out, and we had to start using a laundromat. My roommate was often busy with homework, so I offered to do his laundry for him if he would do mine next week, and he agreed. So I grabbed a bag with laundry accessories, my phone, school books, about $15 in quarters, and our clothes in our dirty hamper, and left the apartment. The layout of this particular laundromat was, at the front of the store, there were two rows of washers and then two rows of dryers near the back, then dryers on the walls on the left-hand side near the front. There were two tables kitty corner to each other, one at the front left-hand side, one at the back right-hand side, then chairs lining the left of the walls. At the laundromat, I threw all of our laundry into a machine, 
and pulled out one of my books for school to start studying. I happened to be sitting at the table closest to the exit, towards the front. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a woman with a child sitting down in the chairs to the left. I also see an elderly man with a military hat, standing in the middle aisle getting frustrated with a machine. It was really hard to watch, and I felt obligated to help him. I grabbed my bag with all my laundry stuff to come to his aid, and asked him if he would like some help with the washer. He said yes. I looked at his washer. He had no soap and was missing a quarter in the slots. As I got closer, I could smell his very potent stench of body odor emanating from his laundry. I offered him a Tide Pod and gave him a quarter. He thanked me, then walked back over to the front tables. I pick up my book to start reading, and he catches the corner of my eye again. He was taking all of his clothes off and putting them in the dryer. He was now only in a white undershirt tank top and his shorts. At this point, I'm realizing that this man is indeed homeless and might have a few screws loose, so I should be careful. I watch him walk to the other table near the back of the store, then walk towards my table with a big trash bag as he sits down on the other side of the table. I smile at him, and he smiles back, showing the fact that most of his teeth were missing and that his canines were heavily decayed. He starts to small talk with me until there was an awkward silence. I could tell that he was really lonely and wanted to talk, so yet again, I feel bad for him and try to strike up a conversation. I ask him about his military hat, and he got a flash of pride in his eye as he tells me that he was a veteran that fought in Vietnam and begins to tell me about all the things that he used to do for the military. When he was finished telling me, I told him that my stepdad was a Korean War vet and I had a lot of respect for those who served and thanked him for his service. He asked me how my stepdad was doing. I told him that he died from cancer when I was younger, but I loved him very much. He looks me dead in the eye and tells me that he was sorry about my stepfather, but that I could call him daddy any time. Then he puts his hat on me. I start freaking out, thinking this man has lice, so I took it off relatively calmly and handed it right back to him. I wasn't sure if he was trying to be funny or not, but I told him that he was making me very uncomfortable and that I'd rather be left alone to my studies. He nodded and took his bag over to the other table. A few minutes pass, and the lady and her kid that were sitting to the left leave. Just like clockwork, that man comes back over to sit with me, this time without his bag. He came over and apologizes to me and explained that he didn't mean to be rude, simultaneously handing me a bag of candy. I try to decline it, telling him that I have a dairy allergy, but he refuses and puts it inside my bag of soaps. I say thank you, and he nods and sits back down. I do my best to ignore him, but he starts making these noises, like he's in pain, just to get my attention. I ask him if he was okay, and he said, yeah, I'm just getting old. I giggle, and then he tells me, I'm sorry, but I have to tell you, you have the most beautiful red hair I've ever seen. You remind me of my girlfriend. I ask him to hold on as I switch my clothes over from the washer to the dryer. But then I ask him about his girlfriend, and he tells me that she died of a heroin overdose two months ago. I tell him that I'm sorry. He then asks if I would be his girlfriend. And without a second thought, I then try and convince him that I'm underage, and that would be highly inappropriate. I'm no more than 4 feet 11 inches tall and about 100 pounds, so I figured it would have been believable. He then tells me that he doesn't care about age and can keep a secret. Then he touches my hand from across the table. Shivers went up my spine and I told him, I'm sorry, sir, but no, I have a boyfriend. And I yanked my hand back to text my roommate to come help me now. At this point, what had seemed to just be a wayward gaze now seems rather predatory, and my heart is absolutely beating out of my chest. I put my book down inside my bag and start gathering things to get the f*** out of there. I'm trying to be slow enough not to alarm him or provoke any unwanted behavior. I was wearing a tank top and sweatpants at the time, 
and that's when he comments that he can see my cleavage, saying that I have nice tits, while then also moving on to explaining the things that he'd like to do to them. I stopped acknowledging him then, threw my bag into the bottom of the hamper, started walking to the dryer where my clothes were, still sopping wet, and started shoveling them as fast as I could into the hamper. All during this time, he's telling me how he would take me to a hotel and do all of these horribly graphic things to me if he had the money, and that he had over 60 years of experience in pleasuring women. I'm still trying to ignore him, and I've almost gotten all of my clothes from the dryer. He then either picks up underwear that had fallen on the floor in my scramble, or had taken them from my hamper while I wasn't paying attention. The bright blue thong catches my eye. That's when I look at him. I look him dead in the eye as he flicks his tongue through the space of his missing front teeth, just like a snake. He starts bringing my underwear to his face, which I snatch so fast that it startles him. He starts hightailing it to his bag in the back of the laundromat, and I panic and head for the door with all my belongings. I have never seen an old man run so damn fast. He grabs his bag and runs back toward me, asking for a ride to a nearby town if I would wait for him. He grabs my shoulder in my struggle to open the door, and then I scream loud. And for the record, I have some serious pipes on me. He freezes in that moment. I make it out the door and then in my car without hearing him behind me. My guess is that he was looking around the parking lot and laundromat to make sure no one was around. I'm not sure though, as I wasn't paying attention to him. I was just trying to get to my car. I threw my laundry in the back seat, and then he starts walking out towards my car. He arrives at it just as I was getting in and locking my doors, asking for a ride again, pulling on my door handles, both begging and crying. I slam my car in reverse and leave from the laundromat having a total panic attack. I get home and wake up my roommate and just start bawling my eyes out. I tell him everything that happened and made him promise that he would go with me next time. I'm not sure why I didn't just leave without the laundry then come back with my roommate. I'm not sure why I did a lot of the things that led to this. I guess it's hard to have a clear head during stressful situations. All I know is that I'm so glad that I made it out. And dear Mr. Vietnam Vet, while I thank you for your service, I sincerely hope that we never meet again. This story happened a little while back, but it still creeps me out just about every time I think about it. That being said, some of you may find this to be a little lengthy, but I think it fits here very well. I'm an adult male with a tall build at around 250 pounds, and I live with my dog. My neighborhood is considered one of the nicer ones in my city, but it isn't without its share of crime incidents. Most of these tend to be car break-ins where people are looking for easy grabs left in plain sight. And in some of the worst cases, the rare robberies of college students not from the area or people walking around who are otherwise not paying attention to their surroundings. Growing up, I lived in much rougher parts of the city, so being alert and observant has always been second nature to me, especially at night. So much so that when my dog and I go for his nightly walk, he knows that it's all about the business of doing his business and doing it quickly with as little dilly-dallying as possible. On this particular evening, I was running late with a work project that had to get completed on time, and our walk was delayed about an hour past our regular time to nearly 10 o'clock p.m. I absolutely hate going out too late. Already feeling anxious about missing our regular time when other dog owners are out doing the same thing, something told me to make sure that I carried this time. So after I got my dog in his harness and out the door, we started on our usual walk up the street moving at a slightly more brisk pace than usual. At this hour, the street is completely empty of pedestrians or car traffic, just eerily quiet. We get about halfway up the street before we start sniffing around for a good area. That's when I spot a red pickup truck 
flying down the street well over the speed limit. The truck eventually comes to a screeching halt in the middle of the street, about 30 feet ahead of us. As soon as he hit the brakes, I quickly walked us a little further up as to put a row of the sporadically spaced parked cars on the street in between us, and then continue walking while all the while maintaining eyes on the truck. As we walk by, the driver's side door opens and a guy gets out. He's bent over and coughing profusely, like a lot a lot, and hacking up spit and whatnot in the middle of the street while holding on to the inside of the truck door with tinted windows. My dog and I both keep our eyes on this guy as we're walking past, no more than about 25 feet away from him. He then looks up at me, while still keeping one arm inside the car door, and says, Hey, can you come here for a second? Without breaking stride, I say, Yeah, no way, man. While rotating my body, and walking backward as we pass him, as to not turn my back to him. While still backing away on our path, I do ask him what's wrong. That's when he says, I'm not feeling well. Can you please just come over here? While still backing away, I tell him no, plainly, matter of factly, and that he can pull into any of the parking spaces on the side of the street and rest there until he feels better. Or that I can call him an ambulance if he's really that bad off. Upon hearing this, his face instantly contorted and went into what I can only consider a snarl. He was also suddenly no longer having coughing fits, or under any sort of visible physical distress. Clearly pissed that I wouldn't cooperate, he then closes the door slightly, but so that it's still ajar, and his arm that was behind it is concealed behind his back now. That's when he starts towards us, saying, Please come here, sir. I told you that I wasn't feeling well. I then clip my dog's leash to my belt and get parallel against the side of a large SUV parked on my side of the street, leaving what I would guess is about 10 to 15 feet between us. I also move my hand behind my back to my waistband and tell him that's close enough while standing my spot behind the vehicle. He then stares at me and I can literally see him working the math in his head on what the chances are of me bluffing. Without a word, he turns around and heads back to the truck, but doesn't leave. He reaches inside with a concealed hand and holds for about 10 seconds before he looks back at me over his shoulder and stares for another 10 seconds, only to see that I'm staring right back at him. I haven't left my position next to the buffer vehicle, and I haven't turned my back to him. He says something to someone else in the passenger seat who's obscured by the tint, and then very quickly hops in, slams the door shut, and speeds off back up the street into the night. Upon later examination, I can only guess that dude was going to try to rob me, or something worse. But I think that both me and my dog played our parts to the T. If I could go back, I don't think there's anything that I would change except for making a little bit more time earlier in the night to take my dog out. I encourage anybody and everybody, whether you live in the good part of town or the rougher spots, be aware of your surroundings and don't ever be that easy victim. So this happened to my mom maybe three or four years ago. My mom is no longer with us. She passed away. But she was maybe 40 at the time of this happening. She was a very pretty woman. Looked young for her age. She even had instances of total strangers proposing to her out of nowhere. Everyone seemed pretty much obsessed with her. And that being said, she was no stranger to dealing with creeps. So one day, she was at Woodman's, which, for those of you who don't know, is a grocery store chain here in the Midwest. It wasn't really in a bad area, but it was close to a bad area and was right off the freeway, so it could get kind of sketchy. She always told me that she didn't want me going there alone, especially at night. 
The times that I would accompany her to the grocery store at night, I was told not to leave her side. Even though I was about 18 years old at the time and damn near my own adult. So anyway, this particular day, she was there during the afternoon doing her grocery shopping alone. That's when she noticed a man in the same aisle as her. He was looking at her, and when she would turn to look at him, he would glance away and act as if he was looking at something on the shelves. Honestly, she didn't think much of it. As I mentioned, she's dealt with her fair share of creeps. So she grabbed what she needed from that aisle and moved on to another. But that's when she noticed him again. Same aisle as her, doing the same exact thing. This time, it kind of rubbed her the wrong way, but she went about her business and again moved on. But the man kept following her throughout the store. Now, it's worth mentioning that my mom was not one to be messed with. She was a very confrontational woman, never backed away from a fight, has beaten the shit out of men before, while also taking beatings from them. She even usually carried a weapon. Things of that nature. So as she's getting ready to check out, this man is still following her. Now she's pretty pissed off and didn't feel safe leaving, so she alerted an employee and the checker went to go get the manager. That's when my mom took this opportunity to tell this guy right off, saying something like, can I help you? And what the f do you want anyway? He replied back to her in a cold and calm manner, saying, you look like the kind of girl who would look really good in someone's basement. At this point, she was not only mad, but absolutely terrified. I mean, who pulls that line out of nowhere anyway? The manager came up, and while my mom was telling them about the guy and what he had said, that's when the guy ran off. The police were called, and they were able to find the guy, hanging out somewhere near the parking lot. But all they did was escort him off the property. That's all they could really do anyway. My mom was terrified that the guy was lurking somewhere waiting to see her get into her car before proceeding to follow her. She ended up calling me in tears, saying she was afraid, and if she was going to be followed or abducted, she wanted someone to know. So she and I stayed on the phone till she arrived home. Thankfully, safely. It took a lot to shake or scare my mom, but she had really good intuition so for her to be as shaken as she was, this man had to be as creepy as they come. His comment to her only proved that further. In the end, she was okay, but I can't imagine what would have happened if she didn't tell someone, or if that man did end up waiting for her and following her home. We'll never have to know for sure, but even the thought of it still sends shivers down my spine. Fair warning, this story has some graphic details built into it. I want to get this out there because it's been heavy on my shoulders for over a year now. The evening that this took place is a national holiday here in my country. After having a nice meal with some friends, my boyfriend asked me if we could go and check on one of his longtime friends, sort of a big brother, little brother relationship, because the friend was in a poor state of health and truly wasn't feeling well at the time. So on our way home, we stopped by his place. Couldn't have been later than 10 or 10.30 PM. We got there, had a beer, chatted with the guy, his wife, and stepson for a little while. After 45 minutes or so, we were about to make our way home when we heard what we thought was a howling noise coming from in front of the friend's house. Although in retrospect, it was much more guttural than a howl. Think more like a growl. The friend's stepson opened the door and asked what was going on, but before the young man even had a chance to finish his sentence, a man erupts through the now open door. This man is absolutely covered in blood. I mean dark, black, dried blood, and so very much of it. I thought he had a dark skin tone since he was so supremely covered. 
It took me 30 seconds, although it felt more like five minutes, to realize the now hardened blood had come from gigantic slashes ingrained on this man's scalp and head and wasn't indicative of a dark complexion. I must say, he looked and sounded exactly like a more vivant, which is a French word for zombie. It literally translates into English as dead alive. And that's what he looked like to me. An embodiment of the walking dead. The guy had three deep gashes on his head. The biggest was from the middle of his forehead straight to the back of his head. Two inches wide at the largest. This guy burst in screaming and yelling before falling to the ground in a heap. That's when everybody just freezes, almost like in a movie. I think that both myself and my boyfriend snapped out of the haze at the exact same moment because we sprang into action. We grabbed the guy who appears to be in shock now by the legs and arms and rush him out to our car. Once he's in the passenger seat, we get in and take off down the road. We had put him in the front seat so that my boyfriend could drive and I could focus on keeping this guy awake and with us. I can't really explain what was going through my mind, but I knew that if we weren't on our way to the hospital right away, there was no way this guy was going to make it. I called 911 the minute we got on the road so that they could send an ambulance to meet us on our way to the hospital. But the dispatcher on the phone asked me to pull the car to the side of the highway and just wait for paramedics to arrive. I knew there was no way we could do that without potentially costing this man his life. I mean, for God's sake, he was dying in my arms already. We got to the hospital before the ambulance and before the police. But as soon as we pull into the lot, there were medics and nurses waiting for us. They helped the man out of the car and into the hospital right away. The police arrived shortly thereafter and interviewed us to learn what had happened. As we're being talked to, one of the medical staff alerts both us and the police that the man has fallen into a coma. This was before the police could even speak to the man. And from that moment on, it felt like the police began procedures for a homicide investigation. And because we were the only other parties present, we were considered either witnesses to a possible murder or the prime suspects for said murder. They finally ended up letting us go home around 4 a.m. However, the cops did ask us to come to the station the next day for further questioning. Once there, they did let us know fairly early on that they were now aware that we had nothing to do with whatever crime had been committed against the man. They also informed us that the guy had pulled out of his coma early in the day, but by the time they had made it back to get a statement, he had exited the hospital and left in a cab, with his destination being who knows. They said that it was likely that the man had sustained those injuries and wounds from a machete attack, potentially stemming from gang-related violence. And the only reason that he survived, in addition to us getting him to the hospital, was the fact that he was on a considerable amount of heroin when he was assaulted. This, in effect, slowed his heart down so much so that it kept him from bleeding out. Had he not been on the drugs, he likely would have passed without ever having made it to the hospital. I can tell you now that I will never forget that night, that blood, the zombie man, and those screams. The only thing that provides me comfort is knowing that I did everything within my power to save a life. The events in this story happened between July 2012 and August 2013. I was a case manager at a housing center in northern Michigan. It was basically a homeless shelter, but with added programs to help people get back on their feet. In July 2012, I was working my shift like normal when a man named Dave came in for a place to stay. He looked like he was detoxing from drugs, and he wasn't the most pleasant person to be around. Most clients that come here are down on their luck, so it was explainable why they were sad 
depressed, or hopeless. However, Dave's attitude was making me rush the intake process just to get it over with. For the first couple of weeks, I didn't pay much attention to Dave. He attended all the morning meetings and classes, but still had an edge to him. He was short-tempered with everyone, and it was very easy to set him off. However, as time went on, I noticed that I was attracted to Dave. I often fantasized about having sex with him. I would wear makeup and outfits that caught his attention, and he would give me genuine compliments. I was giddy about this. I was married already, so this was a big no-no. However, my desire was focused on Dave, and I didn't really want to be married anymore. Over time, Dave and I would sneak off to have sex and mess around while I was at work. Sometimes it was on the property, and sometimes not. Eventually, my husband found out about it, and I moved out. Dave and I continued our relationship, but had to keep it quiet. He came to stay with me at my new place, but I told him that he couldn't live with me. It was too soon. He had no money, and neither did I to help him get his own place. I suggested getting back into the shelter program because they would pay his rent for two years if he would just do what he had to do to get the funds. After some debating, Dave decided to return to the program. So again, we had to pretend that we didn't have feelings for each other. Looking back on it, we thought we had everyone fooled. But it turns out that most people knew something was going on between us, considering the way we would act around each other. Body language doesn't lie. Dave was able to get the funding he needed for his new apartment. He found a cute place downtown and moved right in. I was glad that he was out of the shelter. That way we could continue seeing each other. However, around this time, Dave began to change. He was always upset, depressed, overwhelmed, and climbing the walls. More than usual. The more time we spent together, the angrier he got about everything. Spending time with him was no longer enjoyable. It seemed more like a job, as if I was babysitting a child. I would try to stay home and get some space from him, but he constantly needed me there with him. He would treat me like sh but want me there with him all the time. It was like he couldn't be alone. When we had sex, it was like he wasn't even there anymore. We would do it because he said he had to get off, but there was absolutely no connection, no feeling, no love anymore. I wanted to break up with him, but I didn't know how to do it. He was very fragile mentally, and he said that he couldn't begin to take the hurt again. When we would talk about breaking up, he would make threats about using his gun to end it all. On January 17th, 2012, I went to Dave's apartment after work. He wanted me to stay the night, but he was in a very bad mood. He was punching the fridge because he wanted to buy pot, but he had given me his money to help catch up on my own bills, and now he resented that. I told him I was done, we were over, and I rushed out the door. I knew he had the gun, but I wasn't sure if he would really use it on me, him, or both of us. He chased me outside and tried to get me to come back in. I told him that if he really loved me, he would let me leave. He moved out of the way, and I got in my car and drove off. A few minutes later, I got a call from Dave. I would ask you to turn around, but I know you're not going to, he calmly said. Nope, I replied. He raised his voice a little, saying, why are you being so cold towards me? I reiterated again. We were done. Are you breaking up with me? He screamed. Yeah, I am, I told him. Then he said, with a scary tone that I'd never heard from him before. Don't do it. Why? I asked. Are you going to kill yourself? I almost mocked it, because every time I tried to leave... That was his go-to on what to say. There was silence. The call was still going because the phone still showed a timer going, but 
I never heard a response. I said his name a couple of times, but ended up just hanging up. I figured he already hung up, or he was going to kill himself, and I didn't want to hear the gun go off. That was the last time I ever heard from Dave. He ended up pulling the trigger that night, but I'm not sure exactly if it was right after I spoke to him or later on, since other people had spoken to him that night as well, supposedly going on into the early hours of the morning. They said that he sounded so sad. He was on the phone with them, but they were doing all the talking. The police said that when they found him, he had been gone for a couple of days. I had to clean out his apartment and contact his family whom I had never met and were spread across the United States. I sent his belongings to all of them. I learned a lot about Dave and his troubled life. Disturbing things I wish I had known before getting involved with him. In the same week as his unaliving, I also finalized my own divorce. It was a very dark time for me. I wanted to die. I was feeling tremendous guilt for all the things that I said and how I said them. I could have taken the gun away many times. It was stored at my house for a long time before he took it with him. I lost a lot of weight, had to get counseling, and I can honestly say that I had never felt so alone as I did then. I just wished that I could change things. For three years, it felt like it was my fault that he was gone. I might as well have been the one that pulled the trigger. At least, that's what I thought. I was glad he had bolted his door because if I had found him, I'm sure I would have grabbed the gun and ended myself too. My therapist suggested that I write down my thoughts and feelings. And as I did, I ended up writing a short book about our entire relationship and the aftermath that came from his death. It's on Amazon. It's called Black and Red Butterflies. The cover shows a blonde woman being held by a man from behind. I recommend those who have lost loved ones to their own hand to read it. There are warning signs, and unfortunately, I didn't pay attention to them or take them as seriously as they needed to be taken. I pray that nobody else has to go through this. If the book can change even one person's life for the better, that may potentially lead to one less death in this world. I graduated high school almost a year ago. I had really no urge to attend college or the military and basically got stuck in my boring hometown for months where I slowly became dependent on Xanax and booze. I knew that I was destined to repeat the cycle of white trash set before me by my parents and theirs before them. I knew I had to leave town, so I decided to sign up for a website you may have heard of called www.oof.com Worldwide Opportunities in Organic Farming You pay a small fee and they make available a directory of organic farming operations that will feed you and allow you to live with them in return for a certain amount of work around the farm. The place I decided to commit to was a Hare Krishna community in the deep south. I got there and my car almost immediately broke down. It was a 30-year-old Chevy Blazer that I had bought on Craigslist for about $500. Later on, I was to find out that it was beyond repair at this point. The closest town to the farm was almost 20 miles away, so I essentially found myself stranded and surrounded by the most unbearable hipsters imaginable. To be more specific, I'd say about a third of the population of the community were either first or second generation Indian immigrants living near the temple for religious reasons. Another demographic were aging hippies, also there for spiritual purposes, but running the small-scale organic farm located on the property. Everyone else, however, self-absorbed, condescending, right out of college, but vapid as hipsters. I basically kept to myself, but occasionally was forced into conversations about vibrating crystals and their three-year spiritual journey, no doubt being funded by their parents. I had been there for weeks and was desperate for a real conversation. 
And that's when Michael showed up. I had heard stories about Michael. A couple of days before I showed up, he had left to retrieve an impounded car in a large city about an hour away. Everyone said he was lazy, insane, and would spend hours up in his room doing yoga instead of coming down and working with the rest of us. He showed up late in the evening, going on about how he was going to really get involved with the farming and throw himself into Krishna consciousness. He was in his early 30s, looked as if he was a balding Hasidic Jewish man, his unwashed sideburns curled. He spoke like a stoner cartoon character, his sentences punctuated with and, uh, or, and, like, giving his utterly fried brain time to figure out what others wanted to hear. He reminded me of many of the friends I left back home. We became fast friends, though, as he was the only person there who didn't give me the urge to bite my fingers off when he spoke. We were both originally from Texas, so we talked about the loony, conservative teachers we had in high school, football, and of course, drugs. Every now and then, he brought up subjects that really sort of threw me off. He wasn't able to get his car out of the impound garage, so he schemed the best way to break it out. These plans often involved firearms, pipe bombs, and even telepathy. He told me that he had come to the Hare Krishna temple to befriend some of the gurus and learn Reiki meditation, a form of meditation used to control the minds and bodies of other people. He told me he believed he had used Reiki once to seduce a woman at a party. This is when I understood his reputation. I simply nodded and occasionally laughed when he went off on these rants. I knew one day I would reach a saturation point for this absurdity, but I could probably endure a week more of it. A couple days later, we were eating lunch with one of the gurus. I was telling Michael about my trip to the giant field where the Branch Davidian used to be. He wasn't sure what the Branch Davidian was, so I explained to him about Waco, David Koresh, and the siege by the FBI and ATF that was botched and led to the death of 76 Davidians and four ATF agents. He was absolutely enraged. The government is always trying to silence people preaching the truth. That's so f***ed up. I wanted to explain to him that David Koresh was a sociopathic cult leader, interested in power and nothing else, but he wasn't having any of that. Now I was angry. He was having a tantrum about a subject that he had just learned of, and now he's telling me that I'm wrong and that Koresh was a martyr. This is when I truly saw the insane side of Michael. He was spitting, red as a beet, pacing back and forth. I left the table and got back to work, but nonetheless, he followed me. After half an hour of this absurd argument, I couldn't handle it any longer. I'm not having this conversation with a fucking loon, Michael. How can I expect logic from you? You came here to get superpowers. The look in his eyes changed from anger to hatred. He got real still before trying to come at me. Michael was a big guy, much bigger than me. He lunged and I ran. As I ran, I went through my pocket, praying I had grabbed my knife before I left my cabin. I know it sounds ridiculous, but you don't walk my old neighborhood without some sort of protection. Plus, it was a pretty useful tool on the farm. Luckily, I had grabbed it and turned around so he saw it in my hand. He stopped and contemplated for no more than three seconds before quickly turning around and finishing his lunch. The next day, I pulled the temple president aside and explained what had happened and that we needed to get rid of Michael. It didn't take much convincing. No one really cared for Michael, and he wasn't much help on the farm. I felt bad snitching on the guy. He was in a pretty desperate situation. He had no car, no money, and I can't imagine he had many friends to boot. The temple president also informed me that he had been an alcoholic for 10 years and had come here in part to get sober. I found it very strange that Michael had never told me this. Later that day, I saw through my window someone drive up and hand Michael several suitcases to pack what little he had. 
I saw them both drive off to God knows where. Weeks went by, and the whole encounter kind of faded from my memory. But late one night, I got a text. Hey, this is Michael. We can get my car out for $280. Want to go traveling? I never responded. I wasn't sure how he got my number, but I figured he looked me up on Facebook or something like that. A few nights later, I was in the temple office using the Wi-Fi to make some emails. I was making the walk back to my cabin, and from the pitch black, I hear a lot of loud banging coming from inside the barn. I remember thinking that it must have been an animal. I remember thinking to myself that it must be an animal but also thinking that it must be a pretty big one to make that much noise. I entered my cabin. The actual door to the cabin doesn't have a lock, but my bedroom did, so that's the one that I used. I was pretty unsettled by the banging, but I figured my imagination was getting the best of me. Later that night, I woke up needing to take a piss. The cabin didn't have a bathroom, but we had a shared outhouse. I didn't feel like putting on shoes and walking around in the dark, so I figured I'd just piss in the sink. I know, I know it's gross, but I'm the only one who uses that kitchen. I opened my bedroom door and nearly pissed myself right there. Michael, completely naked, was crouching in a corner of my kitchen, facing the wall. I made a noise that I wasn't even aware I could make, something you would only hear Shaggy make on Scooby-Doo. This noise alerted Michael to my entrance. All he did was glare at me and shake his whole body. I slammed my door and locked it immediately. I knew what he was trying to do. He was trying his best to pacify me with Reiki meditation, which obviously didn't work. I called 911. I didn't open my door or even approach it until I saw the red and blue lights outside my window. Of course, Michael wasn't there when they arrived. My guess is that he ran deep into the woods that surrounded the farm. I explained to the cops me and Michael's history and what happened that night. There wasn't much they could do since no one seemed to know anything about Michael. I didn't even know his last name. I had to leave the farm shortly after, calling the police was really frowned upon since I believe many of the old hippies thought they were still avoiding the draft. I didn't mind leaving though. I couldn't sleep knowing Michael might be out in those woods, angrier than he was before. I stayed up almost three days straight while I waited for my friend to come pick me up. Soon, the farm, the hippies and hipsters, and Michael were all in the rear view, fading away with each mile I sped down the highway. This was a weird experience, I know. The parts that I don't know are why Michael came back once he was exiled, what he was doing in my cabin naked, and what the plan was when I inevitably was going to emerge from my room. Maybe I'm giving him too much credit by assuming there was a plan. Bro never seemed to have a plan at any other point. Or maybe I was simply underestimating the Reiki that he was planning to unleash upon me. In any event... I'm glad I never really had to find out. And moving forward, I'll probably do my best to avoid other organic farms and other Michaels out there. This happened around 15 years ago, and nothing came of it, but it was so weird that I still think about it regularly. I was 16 years old at the time. It was early evening, so getting dark but not yet pitch black, and I was walking home from the bus stop after hanging out with some friends. I had just turned from the main road onto my quiet street when I heard my name being called by a male voice. I was still trying to figure out where the noise was coming from when I see a guy jumping out of a car and jogging towards me, smiling. Again, he says my name and asks how I've been. As he's getting closer, I'm waiting for the penny to drop, but even when he's up close, I realize that I don't know this man, and it's clear from my face that I'm confused. Seeing my confusion, he says, don't you remember me? It's me, 
X. And I say, no, sorry. I don't remember meeting you before, but how do you know my name? He says something incredibly vague, that he's one of my ex's friends. I say, okay, but what's my ex's name? That's when he starts laughing. I'm absolutely convinced that we had never crossed paths before in our lives. And in addition, he looked like he was in his 20s, so how would he know my ex, who was my age? He still had this unwavering, creepy smile on his face. Knowing what I know now, I think that he was either high or drunk. But I started to feel unnerved and wanted to end the conversation ASAP. He asked me to come hang out with him, and I say, no, sorry, need to get home. He's being insistent, but I'm being firm and saying that I need to get home and I'll be in trouble if I'm late. My parents are already expecting me. Basically, I'm just trying to end the conversation politely by saying, nice to see you, but I have to go, and I begin to walk away. He seems to accept it, and thankfully goes back to his car. I feel relieved when I see him start to drive away. That is, until I turn the corner. He's parked literally over my house's driveway, and is now standing outside of his car. Again, with a weird, intense smile all across his face. Now I'm fully freaking out. He's blocking my only entrance to the house. I can't figure out if it's a fluke, or if he knew where I lived. But I don't want to walk into my home while he's there. I stop in my tracks, and he again walks towards me, and starts with the, Come hang out. We'll go for a drive. I'm freaked out, but also annoyed at the fact that he's not leaving it alone. So I say, dude, I don't know you, and I'm not going to go for a drive with some random guy. He then laughs and points to his car and says, but I'm with my friend. And for the first time, I look into the car and see a girl looking back at me. She looks high out of her mind, and is just staring directly at me, while also looking through me if that makes any sense at all. Honestly, my heart dropped looking at her face. She looked miserable and absolutely spaced out. I can't remember how I got rid of him, but I stood my ground and kept saying, no, I don't want to go for a drive. I'm going home. I stood in the same spot. There was no way I was going into my house while he was still there. Until he eventually gave up, got back in the car, and drove away. All while this girl never broke her stare at me. Like I said, nothing ever came from it. I never saw that guy again. And I still don't know how he knew my name. The girl in the car looked older than me, in her early 20s most likely. So at the time, I assumed that she knew what she was doing, but every so often, I think of her and wonder if she needed help. I don't know. Maybe it was more innocent than I perceived at the time. But regardless, I hope she's okay though. I'm going to start this off by saying that I've never really been a Redditor, never used a sub before, so I apologize if this isn't formatted to what you're used to. But after reading some of the posts in here, I think this is most likely the place to put my story. I'm 34 years old, a woman, and unmarried, which means I occasionally get the pleasure of watching my niece and nephew while my sister and brother-in-law go on their bi-weekly date nights. This has been going on for the past two months or so. I previously didn't have much contact with my sister and her family for one reason or another, but in my efforts to become the cool aunt, I've been trying to get to know my niece and nephew just a little bit better. They are 8 and 11 respectively. My nephew has been into skateboarding lately, so I got him a new board for no other reason than that. He pestered me to take him to the skate park to try it out. I told him that I was down, but he had to stay within earshot of me. The reason behind this was because when I was growing up, the area that the skateboard park inhabited was really scummy. It's improved astronomically over the past decade, but what can I say? I have trust issues. I watched him like a hawk while he rode his new skateboard. 
my niece was sitting next to me playing with a naked-ass Barbie that I bought her. When I bought it for her, it was clothed, but at least she wasn't playing with an iPad. I was timing my nephew. I didn't really want to stay more than an hour, but when I saw how much fun he was having, I would periodically extend the time. As the sun was about to set, I went ahead and called him back over to me. My niece decided it was time to go to the bathroom. I, of course, not knowing how to be an adult around children, told her to wait until we got through 45 minutes of traffic, hit the freeway, and drove eight more miles to my house. Before you even say it, my dumbass did the math and decided that it was wrong to make her wait, so I took her to the public restroom near the parking lot of the park. My nephew went into the men's room while I went ahead and took my niece into the ladies' room. The bathroom by itself is enough of a creepy encounter. Gang graffiti, satanic symbols, whole rolls of toilet paper casually sitting in the toilet bowl, along with cracked mirrors. Spoiler, she didn't have to go after seeing the bathroom. I still made her wash her hands, as if she were rolling around in toxic waste, though. As she and I exit the bathroom, I see my nephew shooting the shit with an older man. Yes, the literal embodiment of stranger danger. He had moved significantly away from the bathroom, and I had to do a light jog while dragging an eight-year-old by the hand. As I'm trotting with my eight-year-old luggage, I can clearly hear the man say, Yeah, I remember your dad. We went to school together. Why don't you give me your number so we can all catch up? First of all, I was a year ahead of my brother-in-law in school. I don't remember some creepy late 40s guy in either of our grades. Second, what? I couldn't have heard that right. I got between them and told him to get away from my nephew. I also told my nephew that it was time for us to go home and to head towards the car. The older man piped up and said that he was just talking to my nephew. I took this moment to impolitely tell him that if he went near either one of the kids in my care, his genitalia would be rolling around my purse near my lipstick. I know that sounds harsh, but I don't care. I actually think I underreacted. This man, I swear, actually had the audacity to ask me if I had a teen pregnancy for having kids that age. Then he also told me that I looked too pretty to have two kids. He then continued to ask me my name and how old I indeed was. I'm like, okay, you struck out with my nephew, so now you want to take a run at me? I got in my car and stayed put with the engine on to see if I could see what vehicle he was in so I could grab his license plate. After a few minutes, I just drove off because I just wanted to get my niece and my nephew away from the whole thing. I didn't want to frighten them. Through four years in the military and six years as a sheriff's deputy, I've learned that almost nobody can truly be trusted. The trauma that I faced in my own lifetime was enough to make me resilient. But hell, I still carry decoy money in my wallet and keep the rest in my bra. I also carry a pistol, and there's almost always a knife tucked on my belt. I told my sister and brother-in-law about the guy, and they filed a police report. In my own opinion, the report didn't seem very thorough. They also said that they would have a talk with my nephew, which I offered to be there for, but apparently my views cannot be articulated correctly for a child, which I guess I understand. Anyway, crisis avoided. I just hope this guy is looked into and something gets done. At least an investigation. At this point, though, I can only hold out hope. I just can't really think of a situation where a 55-year-old man would need to ask an 11-year-old for their number. But hey, maybe I'm just old-fashioned like that. This last Friday night, my friend and I stopped at my regular gas station to pick something up for the evening. I pulled up and left her in my passenger seat with the car running and asked her to lock the doors. When I came back out from the mini mart, I went to open my car door and she let me in before telling me that less than a minute before I walked out, a man came out of the gas station. My driver's side was facing away from the gas station and he walked up behind my car, between the gas pump and my side, and tried to open the rear driver's side door. When it didn't open, he just kept walking, made eye contact with my friend, 
and then went and got in the passenger seat of a truck that was parked nearby. Just as he was getting into the truck, that's when she saw me walk out. Now, it's worth mentioning that the city that I live in is the top sex trafficking city in our state, and our state is the ninth largest sex trafficking state in the entire U.S. At this point, I'm already pulling out of the gas station and getting the hell away from these people, whoever they are. When I stop to turn right out of the gas station, my friend yells at me, Holy sh**, they're following us. I'm not having this, so I whip a right turn and head for the highway connection. They're still behind us, so I end up pulling some fast and furious type driving to put as much distance and as many vehicles between us and them as possible, all the while telling my friend to find us the nearest police station. When she puts my phone up on the stand in front of me, I look at where we're going and decide to take a longer way that doesn't make sense to take if you're going to the area we're about to go to. Well, they continue to follow us, which removes all doubt in my mind that what we're experiencing is just coincidence. Finally, we merge onto the major highway and get some distance between us, but they're driving recklessly, doing their best to keep up behind us. That's when I cut in front of a line of speeding cars and we're able to lose them until we get to the police station. We ended up sitting in the police station parking lot for a while, just digesting what had happened before checking in the exterior of my car for anything they might have put on it. We then take another roundabout way to go back to my house, where we'll pass the gas station again, but where it gives us enough time to notice if anyone were following us once more. I know now that this wasn't the smartest idea, but whatever. As we pass the gas station, we see that the same truck is parked in the parking lot of the shopping center behind the gas station, facing the road that we had taken the last time we pulled out. I ended up going to a church near my house to avoid going straight home. That's where we called 911 from and filled in the operator on everything. Since then, we've heard nothing back, not that I expected to. And I've been anxious every time I leave my house, especially after dark. It's almost like I have this weird feeling that I'm being watched, even though I know it's in my head. Or at least I think it is. Update. I went into the local police department today and filed a report. At the time of this encounter, there were a few reasons that prevented us from going into the police station unless it was 100% necessary. Many of you mentioned in the comments that I should have immediately gone in with the plate numbers and it was stupid not to, but we didn't have them. My state only requires rear-facing plates, and since they were never in front of us, we never had the opportunity to get the numbers. Additionally, the only description we had was a blue work truck with orange lights on top and a ladder in the back, as well as the fact that the two people were Hispanic males, one short and one tall, but with the lack of any real description, that wasn't going to help with much of anything at the time, especially considering that if they were traffickers and saw us go to the police station, we doubted they'd be in that vehicle in the area for too much longer. Update number two. It hasn't ended. Ever since this incident, both myself and my friend have had an encounter with the same vehicle, although it was different from the one that night. After work, around 8.30 p.m., a car pulled up directly next to mine in a completely empty parking lot. They didn't get out or try to talk to me or do anything else. They just sat. After a minute or two, I freaked out and went to leave. But just as soon as I started backing out of the spot, that's when they turned their lights back on and attempted to follow me. Luckily, I was able to lose them by running through a red light. The next night, my friend from that evening was on her way to her client's house when she noticed that she was being followed. She thought she was just being paranoid, but when she pulled into her client's driveway, the vehicle that followed her blocked her in and again just sat there like they did to me. After a few minutes, another vehicle pulled up and did the same thing across the road from her. 
when finally, after another few minutes, both vehicles in question pulled off. She told me about this a few nights back, and we ended up deciding to send each other Google screenshots of what the vehicle looked like. We even sent them simultaneously to avoid any confirmation bias. When the images came through, it was obvious that we took images from Google of almost the exact same car. Hers even looked more like the car that followed me than my picture did. The only way they could have known where she lived or what she drives is if they A. Followed her car from my house one of the times she visited since then or B. They followed me to her house and have been watching her there. I think it's appropriate to say that we have one or more stalkers, most likely a group. I'm not quite sure what we do from here, but please wish us luck. Before I begin this story, I just want to say that I live in a big college town, so posting or responding to Craigslist ads looking for roommates is completely normal around these parts. This story takes place a few years back, but I remember it being a Thursday night. My best friend Katie was looking for a roommate as she lived with her mom and wanted to move out as soon as possible. She posted an ad on Craigslist looking for a one bedroom or a room for rent with roommates. A guy who was about her age, around 22, texted her telling her that he and his girlfriend were about to have a room for rent in their townhouse as their other roommate was moving out. Excited and surprised at the affordability, Katie agreed to meet him and check the place out. Since she's not exactly an idiot, she brought our good friend Damon with her. They met this guy and the neighbors, and Katie decided that she really liked him and the place, but needed to get another opinion. Later that same evening, Katie called me and asked if I wanted to head over there to meet this guy. She told me how cool he was and how much we all have in common. I agreed. I texted my boyfriend who was at work at the time to let him know where I'd be just in case. We arrive at the apartment and I'm instantly drawn to this guy. He had a great energy about him and was overall very sweet. His girlfriend worked across the street and came over for a few minutes while on her break. She was also pretty sweet and I recognized her as one of my friend's sisters. She went back to work and we continued talking and laughing with the guy and his neighbors. The guy had made a comment about him and his girlfriend and how they used to be into orgies and things alike. Katie and I, however, are not into such things, but we just left it at that and ended up leaving the place around 3 a.m. so I could be there to pick up my boyfriend from work. The next night, Katie asked me if I wanted to go back over there to hang out, have a few drinks, and get to know his girlfriend a little bit better. Once again, I agreed. It was just the four of us this time, and we were all taking a few shots and had a couple of mixed drinks. Apparently, the girlfriend has some pretty crippling anxiety issues. Katie and I are both sympathetic to this, but the girlfriend ended up having a horrible drunken panic attack. We ended up leaving shortly after that as it was a bit much to handle, although we didn't think much of it once we left. Now, my and Katie's favorite series of movies is Harry Potter. The couple invited us over on Saturday night to have a Harry Potter marathon. But unfortunately, my boyfriend was at work and wouldn't be able to attend. Everything about that night was completely normal up until he put the second movie in. Katie and I were sitting on the floor and that's when his girlfriend came down to join us for a little girl talk and whatnot. A bit later, he came down to join us. Everything was normal for all of 10 seconds when he decided to lay across all three of us. He began trying to grope Katie and the girlfriend started groping at me. Katie and I made it very clear that this was not okay. But being pinned under the girlfriend, I wasn't able to get up as she is much bigger than me. She begins to put her hands down my pants and try to insert her fingers as I'm trying to get up, all the while telling her to stop. He gets behind his girlfriend and begins to have sex with her. Katie and I are trying our best to stand up and extract ourselves from the situation when he finally says, 
Oh, are you not comfortable with this? We tell him that we were never comfortable with it, and we need to leave. He lays down next to us as we gather our things and begins to touch himself. During this time, his girlfriend is trying to pull us back down and tackles Katie, once again beginning to grope her. We finally break free for good and run out of the house. The next day, we file a police report for SA and are still waiting to hear from a detective. Moral of the story is don't go looking for roommates on Craigslist and don't just trust people because they seem nice. Creepy, forceful orgy couple? I think it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Let's not meet again. My name is Julie, and this is my story. My fiancé and I threw a dinner party one time to celebrate his mom completing chemo. I hired a caterer, as we were expecting 25 friends and family or so, and it was more than the kitchenette of our single-story ranch-style house could handle. We'd also only just moved in, so I didn't have a lot of the cooking staples. The caterer said he'd bring everything 75% done, but would need to finish off some dishes in our kitchen. I told him that was fine, so long as he was finished by 5 o'clock, because the kitchen is centrally located, and we'd prefer everyone be finished before the guests arrived, due to the intimate nature of the occasion. The caterer said that this would be fine. He arrives as scheduled at 12 o'clock p.m. We gave him until 5 o'clock, and the guests aren't even to arrive until 6 o'clock, so it's plenty of time. This man smelled of literal dog sh but his accent sounded European, so I thought that maybe he just didn't believe in deodorant. It was more than a sweat smell, though. It smelled like a sun-baked diaper, and that made me uneasy because he was going to be preparing food. I just made sure he washed his hands and then left him to his own devices, worrying that maybe I was being too presumptuous. Throughout the entire process, he keeps pulling me aside to ask me questions and have me taste things. I was super busy that day because my husband had to work during the day and pick up the surprise guest right after. So I was setting up the deck, decorating, putting together the slideshow equipment, coordinating the surprise guest. We flew in mom's sister, so I had to make sure she got an Uber at the airport and she was able to check into her hotel without any issue. Just a million other little things that go into throwing an event like this. So every 10 minutes being asked things like, do you prefer this with paprika or without? And taste it to be sure. We're getting old. When he was still there at 5.45, after two gentle reminders, I flat out told him that I needed him completely out by 6 o'clock, no matter what. He apologized and said there had been a delay because our oven wouldn't stay up to temperature. I'd never had a problem with our oven, but I figured that he's the professional. Maybe it was a subtle problem. A little before 6 p.m. rolls around, and a few of our friends start trickling in. I decide to tell the caterer whatever's done is done, and whatever isn't, he should just put in the fridge. But he's nowhere to be found. I go out on the deck to ask my friends if they'd seen him, and he's out there, alcoholic beverage in hand, out of his chef whites, and now in a tee and jeans, mingling with my friends. I walked out just in time for him to introduce himself to my cousin-in-law, as a good friend of mine. Nope, too weird for me. I met this person for the first time barely six hours ago. I told him that he needed to leave, now. So he goes inside, gets his bag, and makes a beeline for my bedroom. I'm taken aback. I say, excuse me, where are you going? And he says, to change. So, first of all, we have a guest bathroom clearly visible. Second, why can't he wear a t-shirt and jeans home? I tell him that I'm not comfortable with him going into my room, but he insists, saying it'll only be a second, as he goes in, shuts, and locks the door behind him. I couldn't even get a word out before he went in, and this made me feel helpless. I was going outside to ask one of my friends to help me usher him out, but at that point, my fiancé had just gotten home with mom's sister my aunt-in-law, in hand. I had to explain the situation to him, 
nearly in tears at that point. And he was like, what? He went in the bedroom? Why? So in one motion, he pounds on the door, and the caterer came right out, still in that same t-shirt and jeans, mind you. This is when my fiancé says, you shouldn't be in here. You need to leave. And the caterer says, excuse me, but this is not your house. It is not up to you to decide. That's when my six foot four, 260 pound fiance tells him, oh yeah, actually this is my house, as he puts his hand on the caterer's back and guides him towards the door. The caterer says, I thought Julie lived here. My fiance says, yeah, my fiance lives here with me. This admission turns the caterer absolutely ballistic. He turns his entire body towards me and screams, You lied to me, you bitch. I have no clue what he's talking about. He starts yelling about how I led him on and calling me a bitch some more. I don't know who he thought the man in the pictures with me around the house were, but my fiancé says, Oh no, you're not talking that way in my house. Find the door. Now. Caterer goes in the kitchen and starts throwing the trays of food out of the refrigerator and onto the floor. At that point, my fiancé realized two of his brothers, who were both currently offensive linemen in college, had come in and were on the deck. He signaled to them and they came back inside, basically said, this guy is harassing Julie. Since they're a family of all boys, and my fiancé is the first to get married, they don't get to flex their protective muscles all that often, so they jumped at the chance to toss this guy out. The party then went on as planned, but... I insisted we just order pizza and throw out all the food that that man had made. My fiancé and friends kept saying, isn't that a bit much? But I was insistent. We went out late drinking with his brothers and got home around 3.30 a.m. before passing out in our room. At around 5 a.m., I woke up to the sound of the door opening. I figure either we forgot to lock the door in our drunken stupor and it blew open, or one of my fiancé's family forgot their keys or something else in the house and didn't want to wake us. His parents and his local brother have a key to our house. But his parents never, ever let themselves in when they know we're home. And his brother had even more to drink than we did and was definitely not awake and driving around at 5 a.m. It also wasn't nearly windy enough for the door to have blown open. It had been tranquil all night. So I wake my fiancé up with a whisper. Someone just came in the house. He replies with, Probably my brother left his wallet or something. I figure I'm being paranoid and try to put it to rest when I hear a loud crash sound. With that, my fiancé sprung up on his feet in one movement. He told me to lock myself in the closet and to call 911 while he went to look around. As I was pulling out my phone, we hear in that same distinct accent, Julie? Hello? And that's when I realize that the caterer had come back. I'm not worried about this caterer physically overpowering my fiancé, or me for that matter, so I charge right out there. The caterer is shirtless and clearly on something. He's taking the pictures that are of just me off the wall and holding several in his arms already. He lunges towards me the moment he sees me, but my fiancé gets between he and I, and I call 911. Fiancé tells him that the cops have already been called, and it's in his best interest to get off of our property. Caterer says, No! I have to make sure Julie is okay. I say, What? Why wouldn't I be okay? My fiancé rightfully says not to engage with him, and feed into whatever delusions this man is having. My fiancé stays between that man and me, while I head down the hallway towards the furthest room in our house. He watches as the caterer throws photos of us on the floor. Fiancé didn't want to subdue or touch him in any way, so caterer couldn't make any assault claims. Caterer has begun to destroy our kitchen at this point, and by the time the cops arrive, he has a butcher's knife in hand. My fiancé considered going for the gun safe when he first got the knife, since we live in a stand-your-ground state, but he decided the situation was hectic enough without introducing a firearm. Caterer doesn't obey police orders to drop his weapon, and he says that he isn't leaving without me. So they promptly tase him. 
It's lucky for him he only got tased and he didn't antagonize my husband into squashing him. As he's let out in cuffs, he's shouting how he and I are in love and it figures that I chose a macho thug over a sweet, sensitive artist like him and all women are whores, etc., etc. He continues on this tirade the entire time police are reading him his rights. The police ask us to do an inventory of the house and see if anything's missing or damaged besides what we witnessed him do. We go around and there's nothing. But that's when I remember he was in our room yesterday and head towards it. All my panties from the dirty laundry hamper were gone and my personal adult toy had been moved from where I keep it. We were so freaked out in the aftermath that we replaced all our kitchenware, toothbrushes, sent our sheets to be professionally cleaned, and had a cleaning crew do a deep clean on the whole house. To this day, I'm so glad that we decided not to serve the food to our guests and my fiancé's medically fragile mother. The caterer sent me a letter from prison that thankfully my husband intercepted because I was still recovering from the whole thing. We gave it to the police, who helped us get issued a no-contact order. The caterer was sentenced to three years in prison, five years ago. So he's out by now, but thankfully, we never did meet again. This happened to me about a decade ago, when I was 19. At the time, I rented an apartment in a west side neighborhood of Chicago with my sister who was a year older than me. We both worked hospitality jobs in the city, and we both had pretty robust social lives, so it was fairly typical for one or both of us to get home at weird hours, or to even be out all night. I'd take the pink line to and from work. At this point in my life, I was pretty used to being catcalled walking down the street. I'd been flashed on public transportation a few times. Men would bump into me, from behind on packed trains. Basically, the usual amount of sexual harassment for a young woman living in the city. Not much fazed me. Of course, it was uncomfortable, but I was never truly terrified. Until one night. This particular evening, I was coming home from work well after midnight. The train car I was in had been empty for most of the ride. One stop before mine, a man gets on and sits down in my car. Reflexively, I looked up at this new passenger who entered the car. We made eye contact, and immediately, I felt the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I knew I'd made a mistake, that this might be interpreted as some sort of invitation. I quickly looked away, but felt him watching me as the train pulled away from the station. Since my stop was only one away, I decided to wait until the last second to stand up and exit the car just in case this guy tried to follow me. Well, he did. He hung back about 30 feet at first, but I felt the gap between us closing, and his footsteps were getting louder. That's when I hear him trying to catch my attention, saying, Hey! He catches up to me and starts speaking to me like any other man trying to chat me up would. I still couldn't quite shake, the feeling of genuine fear I'd had since first locking eyes with him in the train car. He asked me where I'm headed, and I told him that I was going home. He asked if there was anyone waiting up for me this late. I told him my boyfriend was, when, in reality, I knew my sister was working a night shift, and I was going home to an empty apartment. That's when he pulls his shirt to the side, exposing a gun in his waistband. In a joking tone, he said he'd fight my boyfriend for me. I laughed along, nervously, but just kept walking. We were walking down Cermak, which is a pretty busy street, even that late at night. I knew I couldn't let him follow me to my apartment, so when I came to the cross street where I should have turned, I just kept going straight. Eventually, I had walked far enough that I passed the stop where he had originally got on the train. He walked alongside me for a while, then dropped back and followed me for a while more, before eventually stopping. I thought I would be relieved once I'd shaken him, but as soon as I couldn't see him anymore, my fear only heightened. 
I still had to double back to my apartment somehow, and the trains had stopped running at 2 a.m. I figured that he knew I'd walk too far and would have to turn around. So I thought it was possible he was posted up somewhere on Cermak, just waiting for me. I turned off and walked a few blocks north, and then started my one-mile walk back west toward my apartment. The walk back was particularly excruciating. Since I was now off the main road, it was much darker, and there was absolutely nobody around. I kept telling myself I had to get home safe for my sister, because she'd never be able to live with herself if something happened to me. I just kept putting one foot in front of the other, and when I finally made it into my apartment and locked the door behind me, I collapsed on the couch in what was then an unexpected puddle of tears. Ten years moved on from that, and I've never felt fear again like I did that night. And moreover, I never told my sister about my terrifying encounter, lest I make her worry that much more about her baby sister. Posting this here for thoughts and opinions because I don't know if it should be reported or if I'm just an overreactor. My husband was at a busy market for a work event. After several hours of glad-handing clients and schmoozing, he went to the restroom. As he walks in, he notices a man that looks as if he's about to exit the bathroom. But as my husband walks by, the man reaches out and touches him as he passed. My husband thought maybe he was reaching for a paper towel or something, and thought nothing of it. Now, the layout of this bathroom, there are some sinks right when you walk in, then a wall, followed by the urinals. So my husband goes to the urinal, takes care of business, and when he finishes up and turns around, he sees this man standing only about three feet behind him, crouched down and shaking his head up and down, as if in an oh yeah, motion. My husband is like, what the f man? And attempts to push past him, at which point this man grabs my husband's arm and calmly, yet crazily says, I could definitely take you. My husband shakes his arm loose and washes his hands, keeping his eyes trained on the guy in the mirror. I've already told my husband, this is the one time that maybe hand washing wasn't necessary. As he's drying his hands off, the man comes up again, grabs his bicep, and says, You're built well and all, but I definitely think I could take you. At this point, my husband has had enough and looks right at the guy before saying, Do we need to find the f out? At which point, this man backed off and my husband was able to exit the bathroom. This scenario has left me thinking for several days now and I just can't shake it. My husband even admitted that this was the strangest thing that's ever happened to him, and he was actually kind of shaken up about it. I told him the next day that he should have reported it. My main thoughts being, what if that man had assaulted someone else? What if it was our teenage son that went in there? Or someone else's younger child? What if someone was assaulted later in the day by that man, and you could help to identify him? My husband thinks that I'm overreacting. I told him that the fact that the man watched him peeing and actually made a face and a yeah sound was already too far. But putting his hands on him three separate times? Well, that was assault. If the guy felt comfortable enough to do that, is there really any telling where the line would have been drawn if someone weren't physically able to defend themselves from other advances? I don't know. Am I overreacting, or do you think he should tell somebody about this bizarre interaction? 